What is going on, guys, gals, and other pals? I am Septilins here with Jag to bring you another week of this EGF tournament. Yeah, we're in week seven of the fall split. We're getting down to the wire here before our break in December. And we've got some great matchups for you today on the official EGF channel. Let's go take a look at that schedule. Only four for today, unfortunately. Providence, they had to forfeit. So St. John's going to get a free win there. Next up, we're going to have Canisius College versus St. Peter's. That's going to be a great matchup because they're both 3-2 and two entering this week. They both ended up losing last week, so have a lot to gain at the end of this fall split. Meanwhile, Siena College versus Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac, they've been doing so good. 4-1 on the season. Siena, they're more towards the bottom of the table, so it would be great for them to get an upset win today. And similar story with Ryder and Fairfield. Ryder also at 4-1. Came off two buys basically in a row. They had an actual buy and then a forfeit win last week. So maybe a little bit rusty. Fairfield also near the bottom of the table. So another upset potential there. But today we're going to be starting off with William & Mary against Rochester Institute of Technology. Yep, like you said, William & Mary up against RIT. Now this is going to be the uh, the absolute definition of an underdog story. RIT, one of the top teams right now versus William & Mary, who secured their first win only last week. Yeah, and that was a great win for William & Mary. A 3-2 win against St. John's went the distance. Our the, our first 3-2 uh, match of the series, our first map five of all of EGF. So that was great to see. But like you said, they have a real uphill battle here. RIT, one of those three teams still remaining undefeated so far throughout the fall split. So if there's going to be any sort of amazing upset story here today, we already talked about potentially what could happen later on. But Women Mary, if they get it done here now, that would be insane. Yeah, absolutely. This is, I mean, just going up against an undefeated team this late in the season is terrifying to say the very least. And win or lose today, I really hope William and Mary does not let this shake their momentum and make them a little less scared because they really have every week been on the up and up. And going up against Roch Rochester's Institute of Technology is going to be, yeah, like you said, an uphill battle. This is just going to be a difficult thing to do. William and Mary, we've seen what they can do when they're at their best. And if they can pull that off today, I think this could really be a good series. Absolutely. If they play their best, they can put up one heck of a fight. Let's see how much of a fight they have. We're going to Lee Jong Tower starting on Control Center. And we didn't even get to talk about the changes that came out recently. We're seeing that Baptiste being played by a laundry. That amplification matrix, it's not a square anymore. It is a whole garage door. Yeah, it is a massive garage door. And just as you said, as soon as we open up, we see no Brigitte's online. She was nerfed once again, taken down to that low health, which means she's going to be taken right out of the game. The Junkrat comes out from both sides unique, already picking up actual, a massive elimination to find that Reinhardt. A lot less useful without a Lucio on his side, but unique. Going to walk right into a trap as well. Duplo picks up Blue Jay, so now it's a 4v6 in favor of... William and Mary here is new. Columbus is almost single-handedly helping William and Mary cap this first point. We talk a lot about how great Rage Knight is for this Lumen Mary squad, but you're seeing New Plum really step it up on this projectile DPS roll. The Sombra has been meh, but the Tracer has been amazing. This Junkrat starting out very strong for them. Yeah, the Junkrat, obviously a great Junkrat map, got a massive ult advantage. No, excuse me, ult disadvantage. It's also unable to find eliminations, but able to dump in that damage. Alondri's gonna commit the ultimate early. That garage door's gonna be opened up here. New Clama, the only one to fall to that tire, William and Mary. They've gotta get out of this fight of 5v6, a difficult thing to engage, especially down these tight corridors against the jump rat. Looks like the Junkrat right now on the side of RIT was just able to get that tire so much quicker. Use it very advantageously, and RIT going to flip that pipe very quickly. So despite losing the first engagement, they're already going to be at the exact same point percentage. And they still have that Coalescence to go in with. You saw Laundry commit that square earlier on, that Ant Matrix no longer online. And again, another great pick from this Junkrat right now. RIT, they're putting on a great hold. Absolutely. William and Mary, they broke through the gates. They were very effective with their speed and their execution of capping the point, but they've kind of lost the momentum afterward. They're going to have five ultimates, but Rage Knight falling that early is going to spell disaster. That's another 10 to 20% already guaranteed here for RIT. William and Mary, they're kind of getting full health and spawn. They're going to have to make the magic happen, but the longer they wait, the more ultimates they're going to be pushing into. RIT getting close to six ultimates online. They might be going up against six ultimates, but Lemon Mary also has six ultimates. This could be that complete ult apocalypse. The first one going to be used now by Nuke Lama. 
New Clama goes for the tire, but unable to find any eliminations. Blue Jay now committing a grab, and Essel gonna be able to take Ration Knight out of the fight right away. Alondri, her immortality field's taken down already as well. So right now, who's gonna hit these ultimates first? New Clama, the one to find Link. Link, excuse me, is gonna be a massive elimination, but Alondri and TF2 both falling. This full charge Zarya is disastrous. They've gotta do something about this Zarya, or they're never gonna be able to make it out of their spawn at this rate. Ration having to commit that high noon in spawn. If they get the Zarya here, that would be huge. But looks like she's gonna get out just by the skin of her teeth. Blue Jay gonna live to see another day. And now Link FD has that shatter online. They only need to win one more fight. And Shaco Man also has that Symmetra wall. It's looking very good for Rochester right now. Yes, it sure is. And here comes that Symmetra wall to completely negate that garage door. Baptiste's ultimate now eliminated. But Link FD gonna commit a shatter right into the enemy Reinhardt shield. Gavant now committing that Gravitic Flux. Able to pick up one. Both One DPS falls on both sides. Maybe the McCree, the Symmetra. It comes down to how well can these Junkrats really perform in New Lama. They've got that tire online once again, but Astral just constantly dumping in the damage. Immediately farms one of their own. It's gonna find a double kill on the New Lama and a laundry. New Lama only able to pick up that Lucio in the back line. Gavant desperately trying to keep this point alive, but unable to do so is this Junk rat reigns terror on William and Mary. RIT gonna be able to secure that first that first point of Lijong Tower and put themselves in a very good position for the next one. I still caught four in that last fight. I was talking about William and Mary and Nuke Lama on the junk rat, but it's really Essel that's holding it down currently in that projectile DP Estral just complete and utter dominance. You saw that the tires were used at the exact same time, but Essel getting the better bit, killing in their counterpart in that engagement was very important for RIT to take that first point. Now they're moving to Night Market. They're keeping the Symmetra from Choco Man. Rachel Knight also using the Symmetra for the time being. Could just be for the teleport out of spawn. I would love to see them keep it because this point is so great for Symmetra. It's very enclosed, so those turrets have a lot more value than on some other points on Li Jong. But we've seen Rage Knight mostly just stick to that McCree, so I wouldn't be surprised if they swapped off immediately. Absolutely. One of, if not Symmetra's best map in the game. And if William and Mary, they're able to get to the point first, they'd find much more success. But as the teleporter breaks halfway through the team getting through Rage Knight, can be eliminated right away. A very sloppy play. It looks like they may have accidentally destroyed that teleporter just trying to go through it. RIT, they're going to get a very early point presence. And William and Mary, they're immediately going to swap back to that McCree, but now put TF2 and a laundry onto Mercy Ana. So actually, we see a full team rotation come through. William and Mary gonna swap up the entire thing to push into RIT, who's gonna give themselves a pretty aggressive defense on this point here. Right now, William and Mary's trying to, they're trying to run at Chaos Comp. They're trying to be distracting. They're trying to be high mobility. They know they can't win that fight on the point as is right now. Our Rochester, they've established themselves too well. But if they can run that wrecking ball through the point, have everyone turn around, and then get a lot of good far hits, especially with the damage boost, they might be able to find a kill here or there. Absolutely unique. Gonna have to wreak absolute havoc in the back line, but Essel gonna pick up a laundry once again. The Ana's left out on her own, and in a, in a chaos comp like this, the low mobility is gonna be the thing that gets one of these players eliminated. Ana, she's the one that can't go anywhere. The rest of the team able to keep themselves alive, even if for a moment. But right now, RIT, they lose the point in the blink of an eye, but they're gonna get it back before you can blink again. Absolutely blinking, you miss it right now. Ana is not the pick. She might have gotten a bit of a change with the fact that she now can throw her nades through fully healed teammates, but she is the weakest link in terms of mobility. She will be found out every time. But you're seeing right now, Women Mary, they are getting the picks that they need to win this engagement. Absolutely. They've got rid of both DPS, and that's going to be great for their initial engagement. They're going to have to get in quick because both Junkrat and Symmetra can be back to that point relatively quickly. Believe and Mary just trying to make anything happen. They know that they've got to get this point capped in any, any time now. There's only 50% left. Yeah, you're gonna see there's gonna be the barrage coming out, but the coalescence is gonna help clean up this fight. A great play by CP Link taking out the Mercy first, taking out TF2. That's an amazing play by the Flex Sport, knowing that hey, you know, the fire might be still there, but when she isn't pocket anymore, she is gonna be much weaker. Absolutely. Farah, kind of her Achilles heel, the Mercy disappears and she becomes suddenly just a clay pigeon stuck in the sky for this team. Rochester, they've got basically 30% left, make it 20, and it looks like they're re really ready to secure this point very early on. Yeah, the mines though from Unique might be what they need to when you see the follow-up there from New Lama. So no more Charcoal Man. The tire gonna come out, gonna be countered, or no, actually gonna be used in tandem with their beat. There is no beat right now for William and Mary. The tire's not gonna find anything. So that was the biggest thing that Rochester had going into this fight. 
Yeah, the tire got very greedy, tried to go after the farmer C, but they just played too high up. But now William and Mary, they're gonna commit the remaining three ultimates. Alondra, the first one to go. Unique now just trying to find Link FD, able to do so. Rage tonight, able to pick up Choco Man as well. So Rochester, they're losing their numbers one by one. And CP Link, the next one to fly off the map. Blue Jay is able to pick up that elimination onto Rage tonight, but they're gonna have to do a lot more than that. Less than 50 health right now. This Zarya just giving us an absolute defensive hold, but not going to be able to win that 4v1 at 50 hell. William and Mary from the brink of collapse, they're able to flip this point back in their favor. And Rochester had their winning condition there. They had the Graviton Surge from Blue Jay. They had that tire from Essel. If they had comboed those two things, that would have been a great way to win that point. But instead, as you noted, they went for the Pharmacy in the sky, got a little bit too greedy, weren't able to find them. They just flew away. And that is going to be the point flip for William and Mary. It is last fight territory for Rochester. They're just going to go on to the point if they're able to win this next fight, they can get it oh. good and already able to take one out and take the point. Oh. Yeah, William and Mary there, they get off the point and instead of reestablishing themselves early enough, they wait far too long, they lose their Wrecking Ball, they have to push into a 5v6, and now they're just getting ripped apart one by one. Blue Jay's mech is going to be eliminated, but at this point, it doesn't matter as the, West, the rest of William and Mary is going to be obliterated here. Unique does drop that minefield, just trying to make any kind of presence on the point to stay alive, but that much damage jumping into a single Wrecking Ball, that's going to make all the difference. That's going to be Li Zhang Tower ending very convincingly in Rochester's favor. That was about an eight, nine minute map. And you see Guy Rochester is at the top of the standings. Just a great performance by them. They did give up the point at certain times, but that's okay because they knew how to disengage. They knew how to re-engage. The way they played the end of um, Night Market was just spectacular. They just took the point. They didn't even worry about winning that fight outright. Then once they had that point presence, they were able to win the fight from there. So they knew exactly what they needed to get the job done. And they got the jo job done swimmingly. Yeah, absolutely. We knew going into this match, we mentioned it at the beginning, that RIT, they are at the very top of kind of the tier list of these teams. William and Mary only secured their first win last week. So we're going to see a lot of different play styles from these teams. Like you said, RIT, they play a little bit more advantageous. They know that they're maybe slightly more successful. They know how to rotate around the point and do what needs to be done. And even though they gave it up for a couple percent here and there, they knew that they could convincingly flip that point back in their favor whenever they really needed to. And talking about this RIT squad a little bit more, they've only dropped one map through six games, and that was against Wichita State in week four. So it's been a while since they've been on the losing side of anything. They have just been doing so great, and I'm assuming they're going to keep that going on our next map, which is going to be King's Row, a favorite map of you and me, of everyone probably watching in the audience, in the crowd, at home, on their computers or phones. It's a great map, and Brawl is the king there and i'm wondering if we're going to see any changes uh we saw the lucio moira come out from rit they did not want to run the bat despite the changes maybe they swap things up and try a baptiste of their own here yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see a BAP at the very least on the defense. I think he's viable on the offense as well. But Moira, her healing usage just went down and it costs less to heal even more. So I think Moira is also a great pick as well. She can put out a lot more healing, a lot more AOE, and she doesn't have to only focus on healing. She can use her orb and then kind of use her healing spray or vice versa, use a damage orb and kind of go from there. But right now, Rochester, they immediately lock the dive comp on that offense. So if William and Mary run double shield, I think this could go either way, but William and Mary, they're going to have to play a little bit, not smarter, but a little bit more tactical than we saw on Li Zhang Town before. Running a pharmacy here is a great choice. It's very hard to count on this on the defense. You just keep pushing with the rest of your composition, the, the four others that are there, you just play the point, and then Far just runs around, just reaving, uh, wreaking hell from above. However, for William and Mary, they do have the counters to take this far out of the sky. They do have Rage Knight on the McCree, and we've seen Rage Knight do great things on that hero. New Glama going to be on the Echo, so they do have a little bit of air presence themselves. Oh. But uh, none of that's going to matter, because instead they're going to be running the Sim TP. They're going all the way to the left, so my assumption is they're going to try to TP either to the middle or to the right here. Yeah, right oh, we're going to go for the full statue teleport. I would love to see this happen. RIT, they're going to go for that full statue teleport execution. Essel going to be the first one to fly in, picking up a double kill. Right away, the Doomfist just cracks this point wide open. William and Mary, they had the defense for a farmer's team. They did not have the defense for that. And Essel going to make it quick. He's got less than 30 seconds, and Rochester has already secured first point. And this is a really interesting hybrid composition we're seeing come out from RIT. They have some very mobile heroes, but then they also have some very traditional brawl heroes that you'd see on this map. 
this composition is basically to enable Essel. You saw there from Choco Man, they used the Sim TP just to get into them. And now we're going to see some Hack Fist come out. This is a composition that was really popular uh, like a year, a year and a half ago. You saw it a lot in Korean Contenders. During the World Cup, it was pretty popular before Goats was really a thing. And now we're going to see a different variation of it. You're seeing, though, Gavant going to take out Essel early. So, all right, so you're going to have to play a little bit more passive as they're getting stuck here at the gate. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, Hackfist, one of the one of the few comps that showed up right before Goats, and then one of the few that finally showed back up after the Goats arrow Overwatch. And it's a very effective team comp if run effectively. And Choco Man right now already getting the hack onto the Mega, enabling their team to move forward through this tavern or this bar. Excuse me. William and Mary now have 300 less healing on their side. That is now in favor of RIT. They're doing this the exact way they need to be, but losing Link FD is going to cost them. They need that shield to really engage with the Sombra. Doomfist now going to either have to clean up the mess or get out of the way for that Reinhardt come back. And one of the things about Hackfist is that you really need to run it with the Orisa. You need that pull to have everyone be halted into the same area so that way you can maximize that Doomfist punch. You're seeing Rochester, they're not running that. Instead, they're running the Rhine Zarya. Ooh. Yeah, the Rhine Zarya, definitely an unusual thing to be running with the Hackfist combo. Even committing a nano boost onto a Doomfist who then chooses to ult is quite an unusual play as it's not really going to add any extra damage. Essel's able to pick up those three eliminations, but that's something Doomfist could have done without the nano boost there. So an unusual call, maybe just for that damage reduction to keep them alive. But I mean, our analysis or not, it's working very clearly, clearly working very well for RIT. Yeah, despite not having that pull, still able to have almost six minutes on the clock going into this third point. And they still have ultimates to use. Women Mary, they have to make a stand here. They have six of their own. They need to use this transcendence at the right time. How do you use it? You gotta wait until their Graviton Surge is being used. Right now, we're gonna see the Gravitic Flux be used in tandem with the High Noon. Yeah, Gravitic Flux and High Noon used, but just traded out for a single beat. Not gonna, what, not what you want to see. New Klama, it finally able to take S a lot of the fight. That main damage dealer now taken offline, but William and Mary, five minutes on a point that is notorious for being quite easy to defend, at least for a couple of minutes. They're letting RIT push this cart a lot further than I think they should be. Yeah, they didn't play as up as they could have. This is the corner right here you really want to play, right where you see Rage Knight at. Instead, that car is oh. already past it. Now, Nuklama found out by the enemy right and Doomfist. And once again, RIT's on the prowl. Yep, Nuklama getting a little bit too aggressive. Here comes a Shatter, only able to hit the Baptiste, who is going to be punched right out of their immortality field. Rage Knight able to clean up a double kill on the back of it, though. So a two for one trade in favor of William and Mary with a spawn advantage. So they can absolutely keep this engagement alive. We see unique on the Orisa, the Orisa that RIT should be using from the start, but with this unusual hybrid comp they've created, now swapping onto a Reaper. Nuklava swapping to that Desperation Bastion, but Bastion, a phenomenal hero in particular, on this point, has a lot of mobility and a massive spawn advantage, so can play a much more chaotic playstyle. You see Choco Man in the back line with the EMP. They could try to combo it here with the Nano, with the Graviton Surge to try to clean this point up and get the full cap. TF2, where are you? You gotta be careful, you gotta be hiding, you gotta be cautious, but you're right out in the open right now. Blue Jay has the grab as well. I'm gonna assume this will be a grab EMP combo. And no, the transcendence comes out first. Choco Man looks the transcendence in the face and still chooses to use that EMP mortality build from Elantri now eliminated. That could that could be a disastrous play for RIT. They lose arguably what was their win condition. So now they're gonna have to pick this up. This complete dry fight, but here comes the high new Gravitic Flux coming out once again. Blue Jay gonna be the one to fall. William and Mary able to turn this engagement around. They eliminate that high charge Zarya. Unique picking up a double kill off the back of it. And William and Mary, they live another day. So the great play that was made there was TF2 using that transcendence immediately after the Graviton Surge was used. Waited a split second more, the EMP would have cancelled it, but once you use that transcendence, you are not vulnerable to anything. So a great play by them, but now they're swapping over to the Brigadia. The Brigadia that just got nerfed, as you said earlier, 25 less health, and I've, I'm wondering that's the play. The There is no more uh, Sombers, you don't have to worry about the EMP, but still, I don't know where you really use the Shield Bash here. Yeah, especially William and Mary playing this kind of a little bit further back comp. They're not pushing into Rochester, so Brig is going to get not as much value. I agree. An unusual pick, but they're most likely, like you said, just looking for stuns. Rage and I going to get way too cheeky. Actually, we're going to drop the beat, trying to keep the team alive. Nuklama now in the back line, currently as a Reinhardt, but possibly going to get frozen up by Essel here. Just barely jumps the wall, able to stay alive for at least another moment of the Shatter. Looks like it's not going to be able to come online. Nuklama is going to have to stay back with the team. Link FD has been eliminated as well. And right now, we'll leave the Mary. They've took a six minute time bank to a two and a half minute time bank. So, win or lose, the fact that they've been able to defend this for four minutes is a phenomenal look. And they've still got plenty of time to work with this. What I'm worried about, though, is you've seen the ultimates from Rochester that they've built up. They're going to have that May freeze. And unless 
Gavant can eat it. They're not gonna have much to counter it. They have an immortality field with that saying you see the nano being committed oh. on Blink. Gonna run in with that shatter. The shatter comes out, but so does the blizzard very deep in the back line. It looks like it's gonna work out a very high risk, high reward play there from Assel. But at the end of the day, it makes all the difference. Chaco Man picks up the double kill. Rage Knight finds Link FD, but that card's already been walked in. William and Mary able to take a six minute time bank to just over two minutes. And if they're able to even cap that first point, they've given themselves a, a at least a continuation condition, if not a win condition. I kinda go I gotta go back to the brick pick because I'm wondering, you know, if they stay on the Zenyatta, regardless, even if they aren't able to build a transcendence, you know, you saw how aggressive Rachel oh. was playing. Maybe if you have that Zen you play a little bit farther back, and this play right here was just a masterclass of by Essel. Great team play by Rochester to help really solidify their first point attack and Despite getting solved a bit on that third point, still overall great time bank for them. And surprised Essel swapped off their, um, the Doomfist. It seems like it was working really well. I guess they wanted to work better with their tanks. The May and McCree definitely better when you run the Reinhardt and Zarya because those walls are so important. And then once you have an enemy stuck behind a wall, the rest of the team can just, you know, mow them down. McCree great at doing that. So in the end, they still get it done. And that's what matters. Yeah, absolutely. You beat me to saying it that I was surprised Essel swapped off that Doomfist to begin with. Absolutely had gold eliminations up until the cap of that second point. Maybe that changes somewhere along the way, but the Doomfist was just ripping William and Mary apart single-handedly almost. At least that's how it felt. But RIT currently on a brig of their own. Now, again, it's an, it's an unusual pick. She just got that nerf. She's back to where she was beforehand, and they're going to run a Brig Zen, so the healing is going to be almost non-existent for Rochester. It's going to be very low, but they're all very mobile, so they can run around. They can try to avoid enemies. They can try to get health packs. It really comes down to if Lim and Mary can get those picks early on. They have the pull. They have the accretion. They have the flashbang, so they might be able to zone out one of these fast targets. You see already there is the halt on Link FD, but Link FD not going to fall in this fight. Rage and I are going to be the first one to fall. Actual finds new Klamath as well. So the DPS lineup for William and Mary already going to be down the drain and sent back to spawn. And that's only 30 seconds into this engagement. Now, at this point in the last round, we saw Rochester had almost already capped first point where William and Mary, they're going to get stalled a lot easier. Essel on the Echo now apparently doesn't even matter what hero this person is playing. They do a phenomenal job doing it. Absolutely. That was another 4K by us. So we've seen so yeah. many multi kills here from that projectile DPS player. You saw William here. They were trying to rotate to the high ground, weren't able to do it. And now, I like the brick here. It works out a lot better than it did on your defense. Now you do have even more CC on your side. Looks like they're not going to take the rotation up top just yet. Trying to play the main area of the point. Now they're going to rotate around the statue. Can they find anyone out? You're seeing right now how far back RIT is playing this. They almost found out Link FD there, but nah. That Wrecking Ball gonna live another day for now. Yeah, Wrecking Ball just didn't find, they didn't collapse with the damage like they needed to, but now they're gonna try to find anybody, but Link FD dropping a minefield that deep, gonna find Unique right away. It's gonna be a massive elimination, actually. It's gonna force all of William and Mary to really put themselves into a single corner, but at the same time, we see them get a little bit too cheeky. Link FD, the first to fall. William and Mary, it's a tie right now. They've got a mild spawn advantage, but his new club is eliminated, and there goes Alondri. As I say, they have that advantage. Essel's here to prove me wrong and show that that advantage no longer matters, picking up another triple kill there. Just kills on kills on kills right now for us. So in awe, Gavant gonna be found out way too deep in enemy lines. Narissa, you need to get out of their life just barely there. And you see the rotations that they're taking. They're forcing Rochester to back out a little bit, but then they realize, hey, if they're playing in close quarters, we can just run in because we burn enemies down so quickly. So you gotta play a little bit more out in the open. And now with the amplification matrix coming onto the point, they can. Yeah, it looks like Baptiste is getting home because his garage door is going to open up here in New Glama. Again, the first default is going to be a one elimination on both sides. Link FD, the first default for Rochester here. A lot of mortality field finally gone, and Rage Knight goes for the high noon and pulls that trigger far too early. Unable to secure any eliminations, maybe a little bit of damage, but ooh, there goes Chaco Man in the back line. Flashbang headshot, a classic you see from the McCrees. Always works out well. Here comes the Gravitic Flux, going to force off the Transcendence. TF2 dropping a rally of their own, but Essel takes Unique out of the fight. That spawn advantage hardly matters in this point you're gonna have to pick up these eliminations a lot more consistent if you're William and Mary. They've been up in the numbers, but I don't think they've even touched the point in over a minute. You see the Diva Matrix, they're coming and flush to keep Link FD alive. Rochester, they're stabilizing despite being down very early on in that fight. William and Mary, they have to regroup and they use so much there. Now all they're gonna have is a high noon and maybe another square, but that's a great way to start off this fight. They're able to get one out of the gate.
Not sure if yeah, Septi Absolutely, there. Absolutely, and it looks like it's gonna be in, it's gonna be a winnable fight, but right now Rochester, they've got a couple of old um, oh, just barely, you might have to keep going. It looks like I'm freaking out a little bit, but as I come back, I see Hessel in that transformation, and yeah, you've got to keep going. I'm losing my feet here. All right, right now you're seeing that RIT, they are just holding this. There are two ticks right now for William and Mary, but there's so little time in their bank. It's gonna be do or die. Hessel did commit the duplicate there, so there are no alts online for Rochester. Their closest they have is their support alts. They get that rally online. That'll be huge for them, William and Mary. They do have both DPS alts online. Looking for that pulse bomb is Nuke Llama. Gonna use it. Not gonna find anything just yet. The High Noon also not gonna find anything. So anything that William and Mary had, not gonna find the value they need to get this point. The DM once again coming in clutch from Blue Jay. Yep, Blue Jay unable to, excuse me, with the DM able to find the elimination they needed to, or the elimination of that ultimate that they needed to with ZP Link, not popping that transcendence, just desperately trying to keep the team alive, but desperate kind of a long shot. There's William and Mary, they're the ones that are really struggling to stay alive. RIT to absolutely rip this team apart, elimination after elimination. Unique returns to the point, stun locked right away by actual with a phenomenal shield bash. RIT, they cap all three points of King's Row, but that hardly matters. William and Mary, they don't even cap a third of that first one. So close to getting the full cap. They were able to get two ticks at the end. So if they were able to get something done there, maybe they could have capped it. It really came down to that pulse bomb and the high noon at the end, not finding the value they needed. The pulse bomb just missing a stick that would have been huge. The high noon a little bit too far back. You saw that RIT, they rotated. And we're gonna see some really cool plays from this pass up. And Essel was just a monster here. Yeah, Essel, an absolute beast. I mean, you could have got pretty much any of their plays as a replay here. There's that elimination right away. The Laundry's Garage Door actually does a great job to just push IRT, RIT far enough back for William and Mary to find the engagement. They just unfortunately weren't able to find the eliminations after. And Rachel Knight finds that amazing shot onto, <clears throat> excuse me, Chaco Man there with that flashbang headshot elimination that really cracked it open for William and Mary. But again, they weren't able to find these eliminations fast enough back to back. They would find one, they'd push in for five, 10 seconds, and then two or three of them would get eliminated they'd get pushed right back to spawn and before we move on to our third and possibly final map as rit has put themselves on game point we're going to throw it to a quick break these teams can crack their knuckles just take a moment to catch their breath and we'll see you guys in just a minute don't go far
Welcome back, everybody. We told you it was going to be a short break, and we absolutely meant it. If you're just now joining us, we are we have Rochester Institute of Technology up against William and Mary in a 2-0. And as we move on to Temple of Anubis, RIT, they're looking to take this home quick. Absolutely. And, you know, I wouldn't say they've been quick so far. We've seen a bit of a faster game. I remember when we casted UTA against St. John's. That was, that was about quick. 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so we're a bit over that time, uh, time amount now, but still 3-0 on the last half of King's Row, 2 0 on Lee Jong. So, speed isn't as important when you're still playing as dominantly as Rochester has. Yeah, absolutely. Rochester, they've just had a, a bit of a stranglehold and they've been running a team comp, or team comps rather, that are a bit unconventional. The Symmetra Doomfist in the beginning of King's Row. That's something you might really never see again. I don't think that's ever going to be a meta. I don't think that's going to be a consistent thing, but it worked out very well for them. Well, William and Mary. They've made a couple of a couple of changes, but they've just been unable to adapt to RIT as quickly as they need to be. I think right now, Rochester, they're having a bit of fun with it. You Absolutely. Know? And I think they're trying some new things, just switching things up. Uh, sometimes when you think you already have it in the bag, it's like, why not just try these new compositions, even if they're a bit more wacky? And already we're seeing that Korean dive. So another throwback composition coming out right now from Rochester. The Winston and the Zarya, those bubbles are going to go on to that Winston as soon as they jump into the point. And Essel, you know, you don't usually see an attack Junkrat on this map. Defensive Junkrat, really popular here, but I'm not going to doubt Essel at all. They have just been insane today. Yeah, an attack Junkrat, definitely a weird play, but I mean, with the Junkrat we've seen from Essel today, I'm not the least bit surprised it's coming out once again. These tight corridors, I mean, they, we do still find the defenders in these tight corridors as well, so it really could be a disaster for Lee and Mary if they allow Essel to get the value they want, but instead, Rochester gonna lose two out the gate. Link FD and Chaco Man the first to fall. Essel desperately trying to make the magic happen here, able to pick up two eliminations. Lute finds a third. Essel's gonna find a fourth, and just like that, RIT, they lose two, pushing with four, and it looks like they're still gonna be able to win this engagement. Yeah, Rage of Night on their last oh. leg. That is just confidence coming out from RIT right now. They don't care that they lose two in that first engagement. They say, hey, we still have Essel alive. He's now at 81% to a tire. This could be an amazingly fast cap. If Essel's able to get that in the next few seconds, able to use it well, you know, as long as that immortality field from Elandry is used early or is destroyed before the tire hits, this could be an insanely fast cap. Six minutes almost in the time bank for RIT on that six as they move into the second point. Yeah, RIT looking the same as they did after that Kings Row second cap, but now they only have to cap at this point. So Rochester, they can absolutely make the magic happen here. We've seen them do it before, but Essel gonna be ripped to absolute shreds. They're the blink of an eye. A single pull comes out and Essel can do nothing except die there. But at this point, that hardly matters. There's still five and a half minutes in the time bank. You're seeing right now RIT, they're not de they're not de-engaging for this. They are still right now on the left side of the point from the attacker side so they do not want to lose his position at all that graviton surge close by and the laundry gonna use this amplification matrix yeah and Essel gonna send a tire in quick but it's low oh, it's yes, so far! 33 health tire gets a quadruple elimination from Essel. finds two-thirds of the entire team and that cracks that fight it doesn't even crack the fight open that's the final nail in the coffin for William and Mary five minutes on the clock Rochester Institute of Technology absolutely tears through Temple of Anubis so unfortunate for TFU. They just got that transcendence online. It wouldn't have saved the team from the tire. It does healing. It does not give them protection with shields like a sound barrier would, but it would keep themselves, it would keep the Zen alive. Maybe keep one of the tanks alive if they were far away enough from the tire. And I'd be able to contest that for just a bit longer. But in the end, you saw Blue Jay going in on that immortality field, broke it down. And from there, it was just Essel running in with the tire. So a great team play by RIT two great team plays on both of these points to have almost five minutes that's it that's crazy that's two points how many minutes was that of actual game time that they capped it had to be like two at most two yeah two or three minutes I believe and if I'm not mistaken Rochester had three deaths that that entire engagement we saw Link FD and Chaco Man go down at the beginning of first point and then Essel was the only one to fall on second point on Rochester well William and Mary they've got somewhere if I'm not mistaken between 13 and 17 eliminations on them they've been eliminated that many times so that's just a crazy thing to consider that rochester pushed into two fights that they should have lost and won both of them that's just the sign of a great team 
CP Link and Link FT, they shared that link in their name and they're sharing great plays between the main tank and the flex support. But the other support I want to be looking at right now is actual damage boosting Essel. This Junkrat has been lights out the entire time and that was without the Mercy damage boost. Just imagine how crazy this is going to be now. Yeah, I'm terrified to see Essel with any kind of damage boost, whether it be a supercharger or a Mercy pocket or a nano boost. But Essel with or without it has been the force to be reckoned with. And actual, now on the Mercy, not only offers the the damage boost, but also offers the uh, the resurrection to come through to keep Essel alive if they get a little bit too confident, or if Nuflam is able to find a very cheeky elimination. Yeah, speaking of going a bit too confident, <laughs> trying to take that engage at the top with the Echo, gonna back out, and Essel's giving up the high ground, so that might be an opening, but Chaco Man gonna take out Nuflam. Yeah, every time RIT slips a little bit, somebody else on the team makes sure to find an elimination to really make it more fair and flip it back in their favor. That elimination gave Essel the room they needed to group back up with RIT. Really, and Mary losing a laundry that late into this engagement, almost a minute already off the clock, and I'm not even sure they've seen the point. Yeah, Alondri, she has not had a great time today. Been putting out some great immortality fields, but the team play has just been too good from RIT, destroying them, and then the follow-up is there every time. And Right now, this is just the tanks from Flim and Mary. They're getting pushed all the way around. You saw that from RIT early on. They gave up the high ground for just a moment to regroup, to get healed up. And then they have those movement abilities. They have the jump pack. They have the diva boosters to both the tank. Able to retake that high ground, jump back into the fight, and build up almost five, six ultimates. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to look at William and Mary's old charger versus Rochester, who has almost all six ultimates online, or maybe five. Blue Jay only that 60% mark. But William and Mary, they're just barely capping the 60% mark, other than a couple exceptions who've been able to find some value. Essel now with the tire, just looking to find any kind of elimination, but that's going to be the first unsuccessful tire we've seen. Essel even giving their own life to pull it out, and they're not able to find an elimination. But there's actual with that res I talked about moments ago. RIT playing a very slow defense, but with New Club falling that early, they don't really have to do much else. That Valkyrie is still about to come offline, and Link FD allowed to have a Primal Rage, which is not really a necessary ultimate, but a great one to stall out with a little under two minutes left. William and Mary, I mean, they just, I, I almost feel bad for them at this point. They're being ripped apart by RIT. Blue Jay almost hitting D-Mech there, but the Mercy there actually keep them nice and healthy. And like you said, Link FT can use this Primal Rage a bit differently than you'd usually see. They can use it just as a way to sustain themselves to get that extra health pool. But Mary, they are going to have almost six ultimates online, so those openings have swapped a little bit. But even when they've had that ultimate advantage, they've still been able to unable to win. Yeah, RIT has won both attacking and defending dry pushes, and they've done a phenomenal job doing it. William and Mary's ultimates hardly matter. Now Nuclam are going to swap onto the Winston immediately. Link FD is going to choose to pop that Primal Rage. Here comes a bomb from Blue Jay, and it, it, it's going to be big enough finding the Immortality to and the Supercharger. So that ultimate immediately down the drain will leave Mary unable to find any value off the back of it. So it comes down to this tire from Essel in an immortality field. Oh, You're gonna no, see no. the amplification matrix is gonna be used, but the tire's only gonna find one. Is it enough? That was a huge anti-nade from ZP Link, but the follow-up yeah. isn't there. Yeah, a massive, a massive anti. I was gonna comment on that as well. ZP Link able to take Nuclam out of the sky, and Essel committing that tire just to the Sigma. Definitely an unusual play. I'm not gonna call it a bad one, as getting rid of that shield is obviously very helpful for Rochester, but I think Essel could have found much more value had they just gone past the Sigma and could have picked up two, three, four more eliminations but instead the Sigma was eliminated and now William and Mary for the first time since Lijon Tower have the numbers and they just need to get to the point and make it happen and as Rage Knight picks up Link FD, they might, able, they might be able to at least touch this point. Actual died in that previous engagement while using the res on the Chocoman. Chocoman does have the duplicate, but instead of using it, they're just gonna save it for a rainy day, another fight. That is gonna be the first point going to William and Mary, so talk a lot about progress unless Essel can have the most amazing play of their life but nope just gonna be found <laughs> out so no heroics there today that first point cap is gonna go for Lim and Mary they have three minutes now to get a cap and no matter what they're able to do here they will not have as much time or not as much time as Rochester yeah best case scenario William and Mary caps at around two minutes and that gives Rochester almost or over double that time bank so it's definitely gonna be a bad look but as long as they can push it into extra rounds they're still in a winnable fight and they have their win condition but if not drops critically low gonna be eliminated by Essel and there goes Rage tonight as well there's gonna be two and a half minutes on the clock and right now Rochester they put themselves back in the driver's seat entirely by force as they 
just take William and Mary down one by one once again. They're going for the spawn camp right now. It's a risky play. It could end up going badly for them. You see Essel all the way, and they lose Choco Man, but Essel, he's going to wait now for that tire all the way behind it. It's going to only find one, but... Oh, that could have been huge. That could have been colossal. I could not help but gasp as I watched that happen. Essel, even finding that elimination, I mean, that just stalled William and Mary maybe 10, 20 more seconds. And at the end of the day, that small pool of time could make all the difference. So Rochester right now, even without that tire, they've still got two ultimates. They're coming up on a third, and they could absolutely hold this with or without them as William and Mary push in. They're about to have four of their own. Blue Jay, they're going to have to use the self-destruct to get the remake. Link swapped off of the Winston onto the Reinhardt. And I think that's a good play because Link was going in a bit too deep before. But oh. now you see this is a great play from William Mary. Can they find any kills, though? It looks like RT, they're just trying to get out of that LOS. Yeah, and they did a great job doing it. Chaco Man now swapping out of the Orisa. So we're going to see a super charge. Oh, just kidding. They're going to get ripped apart right out of that. Two eliminations have, make it three eliminations have come through in William and Mary's favor. And if they're able to find the eliminations they need to keep the point alive, they might be able to cap with around a minute on the clock, but anything less than a minute basically signed their, their death certificates here. As the Gravitic Flux is able to come off with the bond together, just trying to make that magic happen. Transformation from Wood Club and now offline as well, but Choco Man able to pick up the entire support lineup for William and Mary. So just when they had that final first real advantage they've had, oh! Mercy. Huh, all right, the, the Mercy swap to res your support is a weird one, but one that looks like it might have worked out for William and Mary. We saw this in a different tournament earlier this weekend. We were talking about how we never thought we had seen something like that. The duplicate being used on the Mercy. It isn't a give them a res, but you saw even though they have four people there, only two of them are on the point, so it's getting capped very slowly. Yeah, again, wow. Ooh, Link FD kind of kind of throws that shatter into the pillar, still able to pick up Nuke Lama, and Essel back on the Doom Fist. That's a terrifying thing to look in the face. Elandri finally takes ZP Link out of the play. Here comes another window from Elandri. She's finally able to play that battle she's wanted to all day. Right now, you've got to do something about this Doom Fist, and there it is. Elandri picks up a third elimination of this fight. This Baptiste just desperately trying to keep the team alive. Finally going to be eliminated by the tank lineup from RIT. There's 10 seconds left on the clock, and I don't think there's anybody from William & Mary to even touch. It looks like this might be the yeah. Event and TF2 are going to be there. They will touch in the nick of time, but will it be enough for the rest of the team to get back in there? The DMEC already coming out. The high noon from Rage Knight in the back isn't going to find anything, and it's just going to be clean up right now for RITs. They're going to take this series 3-0. Yeah, that's going to be a very effective 3-0 for RIT. We all have a good underdog story, but RIT, they're one of the best teams in the league, and that is by no means an accident. They are a phenomenal team all around, and William and Mary, at their best moments, can be a very great team as well. But just simply looking at the statistics, William and Mary getting their first victory in week five or six of this tournament, and Rochester not having a loss all season is just a telltale sign of how we expected this game to go. And overall, William and Mary, they had moments where they really got to shine, but RIT, especially Essel on that junk rat, just never gave them the opportunity to thrive. And this was our first time casting RIT this season. Sure. You and I had wanted to do this for a while, but finally in week seven, we get that opportunity. We've seen UTA and Maris up close, both of those teams looking amazing. RIT looking just amazing as well. They're all on that same level. It's why they're at the top of the table right now. We are going to take a very short break, but don't be going anywhere just yet. We're going to be having an interview of ZP Link right in a second.
Welcome back, everybody. If you're just joining us, as you can see below Jag and I, RIT able to take a 3-0 victory over William & Mary. We are now here for our interview process with the player from RIT, ZP Link. How are you, my friend? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you guys are doing great. You've had a very successful season, one of three teams left remaining undefeated. So my question for you is, against these other schools, do either of them kind of make you guys shake in your boots a little bit? Do you seem a little maybe nervous to go up against either of these schools, or do you think you guys were, are able to come out on top of those engagements? Uh, we try to take it one game at a time, you know, not worry too much about the future, but uh, we're, we're, we're in it to win it still, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's the only question I really have for you, so now we'll throw you to Jag, who I'm sure has a couple questions for you. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that we're not going to be able to see you guys play against UTA or against Maris during the fall slip, but maybe in the spring slip we'll see those top three teams go at it. Uh, one question I wanted to ask for ask you, um, you guys had some very interesting conversations today, some stuff that seems like a blast from the past. Was that something that you had planned going into this series, or is it you guys just kind of switching things up and having a bit more fun with it? Uh, we were doing a lot of scrimming against Double Shield because we were struggling against that. So we were kind of trying out some new comps, uh, and uh, it worked pretty well. So we're, yeah, we're pretty happy with the results. Yeah, if you don't feel comfortable with Double Shield just yet, why not try to counter it? Did amazingly cool. with that, with that 3-0 victory. And my last question, I got to ask, uh, your main tank uh, also has Link in their name. Is, is that just like happenstance? It just happens to be something, or is that something that was done on purpose? Uh... Well, when uh, when Link joined the team, we uh, did not know each other, and we've actually kind of <laughs> it's kind of been a joke in our team that just casters keep <laughs> uh, having trouble distinguish uh, distinguishing between the names. So uh, maybe one day we'll we'll have to change it up. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we like it so far. I, I like the camaraderie. I, I, I was Agreed. a fan of it. We didn't have a problem with it. At least you got those different letters in it that help uh, differentiate the two of you. Yeah, I'd really struggle if you were perhaps in the same role, but at least you <laughs> yeah. were playing different roles. That really helped a little bit. <laughs> but I think that's all the questions we have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us and extend our congratulations to your team. You guys, like we've said, one of few remaining undefeated teams, so very impressive to make it this far and only drop, if I'm not mistaken, a single map throughout this entire thing. So that is absolutely amazing. But like I said, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you. And with that, that does bring our interview to an end. So up next, we've got another game coming at you guys in just a bit, so don't go too far, and we'll... See you guys then. I think that's everything for now. There might be a game happening on the main channel till that one starts, but like I said, we're coming up at, we're coming up at you soon. So for the time being, Septilins and Jag signing off, but don't go far because we'll be right back.
I could stay like this Forever following you Just don't get too far And I'll be right where you are This is the first time I'm walking away from you But this is the third time you broke something new from you And don't cry, I keep telling myself this is
Satan sucks, but you're the best. Holy smokes, you pass the test. When I'm with you, I feel blessed. A chinchilla. Satan sucks, but you're okay. Since you came, things go my way.
Welcome back, everybody. After a very convincing win from RIT today, Jag and myself casting that game, RIT takes it home 3-0. But now we're going to have a match that we have both agreed is going to be a little bit closer. This one going to be between Canisius College and St. Peter's University. Absolutely. We agree on that and many other things specifically for this agreement. It's because both these teams are coming in with the same win-loss record, both at 3-2. and two. And last week they were 3-1, and one, both of them falling last week to Quinnipiac and Maris, respectively. So they went up against the tippy top of the table, weren't able to come out on top of win. And now they want to inch closer to finishing the fall split above that 0.5 record because they could finish, you know, four and four, but five and three sounds so much better or yeah. uh, six and two even. Yeah, six and two, still that possibility, obviously much better than that four and four. And that's something that both these teams are going to be gunning for. One of these teams gets to walk away with that victory, but of course, one has to go home with another loss under their belt. So it's going to put one of these teams on a two week losing streak. Yeah, and actually, I was just thinking about it. And both these teams have out a bye. So I don't think they're going to be playing eight games in this split. But still, you know, if you finish, what would it be? Five and two? That'd still be a great position to be ending the split in. So one game here today will get you closer to that win loss record on the season and just like as it has been all day and will continue to be we're going to be starting off this series on Li Zhang Tower. Yeah, Li Zhang Tower, one of my personal favorite control points. It's one that I love as a Lucio player, as a wrecking ball player, as the occasional Doomfist player, but I don't like to go near DPS. Um it's something that works out really well for um ver versatility is a, a word that I use very often these teams. They have to adapt. All three maps of Li Zhang Tower are maps that force different team comps to be run effectively. So we're going to have to, in my opinion, it's really going to come down to which one of these teams can adapt faster and more efficiently than the other. Well, it looks like we're going to be starting out on Gardens, and I'm a bit surprised by what we're seeing from St. Peter's to start off with. For all, yeah, there you go. Yeah, see, every time we talk about it, it softs <laughs> immediately. The dive tanks here on Gardens, much better. It's accomplished, and you want to play. You want to take control of that point Five, early on, but... Four. The support lines and the DPS that are going to be completely one, different here, and one. not just in the sky. There's not going to be a real counter for that echo from St. Peter's. It's going to be Tiger having to try to take that, take them out in the sky, as the Diva is the only one that can really fly up in their face. Yeah, absolutely. Not only am I surprised to see no Wrecking Ball, I'm also surprised to see no Baptiste from these teams, as we were talking about earlier. He was just recently buffed, and we're hardly going to see supports at all, as both Celon Squad and Devil have been eliminated. In Special K, the next of Balls to main tank. Not missing for Canisius, but this fight is still far from over. We're going to need at least one more clean elimination from one of these teams to really flip it in their, in their favor. But St. Peter's University, they take that elimination on a Special K, and they they take that inch and run a mile as they are able to cap the first point in about 20 seconds. Yeah, it was a great engage there from Nachos. And Nachos said, Nachos support living today. And yes, I hate myself ah, for that ah. joke. And already they're so close to that duplication and Min Min not too far behind with the Valkyrie on the Mercy. So the Echo Mercy, not as common as you see as a pharmacy, but still very deadly in the sky. Yeah, Echo Mercy, arguably deadlier than a pharmacy, depending on how the Echo is played. But Sellout Squad gonna get that Vengeance kill on a Junkrat Tiger, finding one as well. The DPS down on both sides, and as Rez loses that mech, Ricardo's Resurrection is gonna come through clean. Mikmin's able to make it back out of the fight as well. Nacho's now on the Reaper, gonna commit this Death Blossom, They're able to find not one, but two, and the D-Mech as well. They're gonna call that two and a half, make it a three, as Nachos finds Tiger with that elimination. St. Peter's a very convincing fight win, and they only commit one ultimate to do it. Absolutely, and now look at what they built up in the meantime. They're gonna have that primal rage. They almost have that May Blizzard online, so they still have ultimates to use here. If they're able to get that Blizzard up and they're able to make sure it's not eaten, or as long as they're able to catch one or two people in it, they'll be able to win this fight pretty handedly. Absolutely, but here comes the primal rage and the Blizzard. The Valkyrie out as well, committing three ultimates to a fight that really to them has essentially already been won. It's something that we expect to see early on. We see Winston almost dying even with that primal rage online. Sellout squad gonna pop the full lessons that just attempt to keep the team alive but that tire gonna come through always a little bit stronger we saw lucio from canisius drop the beat just to keep that team alive the resurrection comes through alive on both sides we're back into that clean 6v6 with canisius now committing their ultimates to this fight as well and this is last fight territory you're seeing now the spider here does have that death blossom online the deeper bomb being committed so there is no matrix online for two seconds but isn't able to use it in time not just instead using the duplication to use another one of their own death blossoms and st peter's holding on to that once again and now devil and Nigiri, they're throwing themselves close to this point and almost falling they need that lucio to stay alive to touch 
Yeah, and the Lucio might not even be able to now as they fall off the wall. And oh, someone's able to make it in there. It wasn't the Lucio, but it looks like it's going to be the Junkrat who immediately pays the price of their life with that low mobility. Spudinator desperately trying to keep this point alive, able to take out the Echo Mercy combo. Devil able to pick up an elimination as well. Half of St. Peter's University already gone, but wins to a Primal Rage, just trying to make the magic happen. Gonna be unable to do so as even in that Primal Rage Reaper is a force to be reckoned with. Canisius in that final hour pick themselves up and cap the point. Yes, but neither on that Reaper is a true tank buster. You can do so much damage, even with the Winston's Ester Health pool from the Primal Rage. Still gonna just chow down through it. Now, the first clip has happened for Canisius. They have control of the point, but they don't really have a lot to work with for this next fight. That Sound Beer might be the only thing they have online. And St. Peter's, they still have some tools to work with. They have that Valkyrie, they have that Blizzard. The Blizzard didn't get a ton of value last time, but now being able to demech that Diva, they just have a free use of it. Yeah, there goes the Blizzard. It's gonna go in quick, and it looks like it's not gonna be able to find any immediate freezes. Devil able to drop that beat beforehand. Not gonna keep them alive with that kind of damage coming out of St. Peter's University here. Minden, she's not popped that Valkyrie Cole Lessons coming out as well from Sellout Squad. It's gonna be two up, make it three in favor of St. Peter's University as Nachos. Picks up yet another double kill. We're gonna find the D-Tech. Here comes another Death Blossom. Able to secure two more kills with the, with the back end of that Death Blossom. 50% on the point for Canisius, but I don't think they're gonna be able to recontest here. That overtime ticker is gonna oh. be not stopped just yet. There is Lucio able to touch, and there is the orb coming in from the Moira to help keep them alive. Bring in Bunny, gonna switch over to the last second, but Spudnator oh. not gonna find anything of the Death Blossom. Spudnator is Death Blossom down the drain there on St. Peter's University. Yeah, Rez all has but secured this victory. One elimination comes through out of the maze from Junkrat here. Canisius desperately trying to flip this point, but it's two more eliminations coming through St. Peter's. Junkrat, the sole survivor on the point, can only do so much by themselves. And St. Peter's University. They, they they let the points slip through their fingers, but at the end of the day, they are able to get it back. Not just the example of uh, Reaper at home actually being better than Reaper in the store, is you're seeing those duplications, those death blossoms, they found so much more value, and here's one of them right now at the beginning of this point. I mean, just complete dominance. Is able to cancel the uh, res there. I didn't even see that, but Frankenman was trying to go for a very aggressive resurrection. Wasn't able to find it because of that death blossom. Uh, they got two in this fight with the Echo Alt. That's how great Duplicate can be. Yeah, Duplicate, an absolute just powerhouse of an ultimate, one that finds incredible value, especially swapping to a high damage character like that Reaper. We saw Nachos get, I think, two Death Blossoms per Duplicate, so that really came out very effectively. As we move into Night Market, we're gonna see Canisius go for a little bit of an unconventional swap here. Not only are they gonna be running a Sombra, they're gonna be running a Winston Roadhog, and we're finally gonna see that Baptiste come out. So a lot of changes come out from Canisius, where very few come out from St. Peter's. They're kind of running that, if it's not broke, don't fix it mindset, but it's a nasty hook comes through on the sellout squad. They're not making it out of that one alive. And that gives Canisius a massive advantage against St. Peter's. Now they just need to take advantage of it and continue to hold up. You see though, St. Peter's, they do have the point right now, so if they're able to sell out for a little bit longer, they can. They do get the first cap. There is a pack right now onto the Reinhardt and almost got out of there alive, but this fight is going to go in Canisius' college's favor. Yeah, Canisius finally flipping the point in. They're going to have to give up about 10% to do it, but better 10 than 100, you know, so they are able to take advantage of this and push it very aggressively. Canisius, now they flip the point, and they're going to be able to catch up relatively quick. St. Peter's only securing 12%. That's the issue right there with the Moira. You saw that Cell Squad falling first. Didn't have that Wraith Swarm. You know why? Because they used it as a mobility uh, ability at the beginning of that engage, just trying to get to the point a bit quicker. If they had had that, they might have been able to survive that. Absolutely. They might have been able to survive at the end of the day there, but you know, you've got to know when to use it and when not to. I think they probably didn't expect the engagement to happen so quickly. And just like that, Ricardo Wraith stayed and just Wraith straight back out, unable to find a lot of value. But Spudnator gets a little bit too confident with their elimination skills and tries to find the elimination, but instead gets eliminated themselves. Not just takes special care off the map with that whole hog and secures another elimination on the Tiger. Right now, in my opinion, the player to watch out for in St. Peter's because they have just been flawless on this Echo so far. No doubt about that. You saw Spudinator, as you said, going a bit too deep there. They tried using the high noon amplification matrix, but instead it was uh, Ricardo, a great bait there. It was just right in the face of the McCree, ended up using their own ray form, got out of it, and then it looks like Spudinator's got a, bit, a little bit uh, too confident. Yeah, confidence is, you know, they can absolutely get you killed at the end of the day. You've got to know when to push in and got to know when to hold them and when to fold them, right? And Spudinator there got a little bit too confident, refused to fold them and got folded instead. So Nachos, once again, looking for massive elimination, taking Spudinator clean out of the fight. Yet another transformation going to come through. They're going to be hacked this time. That hardly matters at the speed this Echo is farming. 
already at 50% to another whole hog duplication and timing. Only about one second, so not gonna find a kill there, but right now, St. Peter's, they are in the spawn of Kinesis. Yeah, Kinesis, this is a prime opportunity to at least attempt to back cap the point, but instead, the Sombra, the one player that'd be able to do that quite easily, is choosing to stick with the team and to hold the fight aggressively. Oh, I'm sorry. So they're, they're winning this fight very early on. They don't even have to use the EMP. You see that St. Peter's, they got too confident there. Same thing that Spudnator had earlier on. They went way too deep, and they just lost that fight after some very good hacks coming out for Muba. That EMP still gonna be online, and Min Min, Min not quite at that Valkyrie yet. They really need to get that online and use it before the EMP falls to have any chance of winning this next fight. Yeah, depending on how aggressive Sombra plays here, Canisius could take home this fight rather convincingly, but this is almost identical to what we saw on Gardens just minutes ago, where St. Peter's, they had that last fight scenario, Canisius capped, and St. Peter's flipped it right back around in the blink of an eye, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that exact same thing happen. Well, there is one production bubble used already. Oh. The Graviton Surge will be thrown in, and the Death Blossom on top. That's a massive, that's a massive ultimate combination there. They get up the Immortality Field as well, and Ricardo on a Rampage. We're not saying Nachos was the player to watch out for, and one of the prove us wrong that this Reaper right here is the damage dealer for St. Peter's. They absolutely went on to try, but they can't let their hubris get ahead of them. They almost gave their life to that soldier, and they're not going to let this soldier out alive. Spudnator again, just barely the skin of their teeth. They have to make that an engagement. Ten seconds left for St. Peter's, just as I predicted. They did exactly what I expected them to do. They pushed in slow, they let Kanisha's cap, but then at the end of the day, they might be able to take this home just as easily. The whole hog not going to find out the Winston on the other side of that trade's coming in. Yeah, trade's coming in quick. St. Peter's going to find a double elimination. Min Min, she gets the res, but can she make it out of that engagement? Valkyrie is online. She's able to do so. Nachos finds Tiger and that Roadhog missing. He's he's a damage dealer all his lonesome and special K now gone as well. The tank lineup gone for Kanisha. That leaves the remaining four kind of desperate. They can only do so much without the tanks there. Overtime kicks back in as Frankie Bunny sends herself into the fray. We'll be eliminated right away in St. Peter's University. Takes Li Shang Tower 2-0. The EMP was the fight winner there for Kinesis, but what happened? They just don't use it in time. They use it way too late in the fight. They didn't use it right before the Graviton Surge was thrown in. Instead, they waited until they were down to people already. They just walked through the amplification matrix that Frank and Bunny put out. And that was just... That was just all St. Peter's for most of that. There were a few back and forth moments, but I mean, as you said, it looked very similar to that first point on the second one. Even though Kinesis, they had ultimates to use... SPU, they were just able to get it done. They were able to play as a better team there. They were able to be a little bit more coordinated, and coordination is so important at the upper echelons of collegiate play like this. Yeah, absolutely. Team coordination at the end of the day is what this game is all about, and we just saw St. Peter's they were maybe coordinated a little bit more than Canisius. Like you said, there were those moments. They were back and forth a little bit, but at the end of the day, St. Peter's, they were on top of that fight nine out of ten times. They lost the point a few times, but they always took it right back. And as we go into these replays here, we're going to see really the moments where it really came down to St. Peter's being able to get aggressive. And this is going to be that early hook onto Sellout Squad. And we're going to see that the Moira just barely at the end of that hook gets the elimination, comes through as well. So Canisius, they have that massive opportunity here. Here's Nachos on that Roadhog as well. Now we saw they got hacked out of the one whole hog, but the value they find here, just pushing Canisius further back into spawn. Every second counts right now, and they're able to get them all the way back. Rez is going to hit that, I believe, three or four man grab as well in this replay, which is going to be the replay that really we see that, um, excuse me, that Death Blossom come out as well from Ricardo, cleans up two and just cracks the point wide open for St. Peter's once again. As soon as that bubble came down from the Winston, that's when you did the EMP. You just jump yep. right in, push forward with the square. I think, though, they were playing a bit too passive. They were waiting for the rest of St. Peter's to come onto the point. You saw where the Baptiste was. They had the square all the way in the back, waiting for the Ant Matrix to be used. But you can't do that. You got to know your winning conditions. You you can't sit on an EMP. You can't wait for the team yeah. to push. And you have to be the ones pushing into them. You saw what happened there. They used the Graviton Surge. They used the Death Blossom in tandem. That EMP comes out so late. The amplification, amplification matrix is not valuable at all. And Kanish is going to lose Lee Jong 2 But they're only down one map so far in this series. I could still see this going to a map four or five, depending on if they get their stuff together. Also, they had a bit of a weird comp, as we talked about earlier. The Winston Roadhog doesn't exactly work out in tandem as well as some other things, so maybe if they try to run some more back-to-basic stuff, they'll be able to get into the series. Yeah, back-to-basics is never a dangerous place to go. You want to stick to your guns, you want to stick to what you know works best. And like you said, we talked about this a hundred times before, so we won't talk about it much more, but as playing Sombra, 
You cannot sit on that EMP. That is the entire point of her kit. Her ultimate, one of the fastest charging DPS ultimates in the game, if you do the damage correctly, you just, you need to be using that way more often. I don't think we saw a single EMP come out of that engagement. Let's move on to King's Row. We've talked about this many times. This is the home of Brawl. And we see a swap from Kanishas. They've got Infamy now on that main tank position. So it's going to be a little bit different of a lineup. Mellow Monster as well, I believe, is a new sub in for, yes, we see Devil swaps out of the DPS role and Mellow Monster now on the Ana position. So that's going to be a lot of swaps coming out from Kanishas, essentially half of a new team. Hey. Is it going to be what they need to get them over the edge here and take a map? You know, sometimes swaps, they can be a bit risky. Sometimes those risks pay off. Composition also a bit different. The grab dragon probably going to be what Kanishas is looking for to win these fights. There is no speed on either side so far. It's the same supports across the board. Finally going to see some more on a play. See how that nade change comes into play. Her... Nade now is going to go through teammates if they are at full health, so maybe some giant anti is going to come in across the way. Yeah, absolutely. On and can get much more aggressive, and Nacho is just trying to find any value on the Ash, but unable to really do so quite yet. So really starting to put the damage down on the Spud Miner, who we've seen time and time again get caught out due to poor positioning. And they kind of stood there a little bit longer than they should have, but they were able to make it out alive. He's, of course, Spud Miner the first one to go, as I say it. I don't really want to call that a caster's curse, but Infamy going to be the next to fall as the charge comes through. Devil able to pick up Rez with that Storm Arrow, but Nacho is going to pick Devil right back up. The Resurrection comes through under Rez. We see St. Peter's already pushing into the full six. Getting ready to cap with less than a minute off the clock. That was a great push. As he said, Spun there playing on that high ground head. Didn't have that much help. I was surprised that Frank and Bunny wasn't on them with the damage boost or some sort of pocket. That's going to cost them that first pick. And then Infamy just charging all the way in. Went way too deep. The bubble was not there from Special K. A great anti-nade from Cello Squad. Look at the ultimates already online for St. Peter's. They're going to have the Shatter the Valkyrie and the Nano Boost. So a lot to work with as they get into Streets phase. And you see Kinesis, they're playing very far back. They really need to push onto this Archway. This Archway is a great defensive position for the defense because there's so few places for the attack to come through. Yeah, absolutely. The defense, we talk about this a lot. This is kind of King's Row point one and a half, an infamous point to really defend and stall the point right here. Spudinator once again getting very aggressive in the front line. And if I'm not mistaken, last time we spoke to Canisius, they were called Infamy as kind of a Reinhardt specialist. So to have that Reinhardt in now and be losing a map so convincingly as they are in this moment, it's going to be disastrous to have that Reinhardt kind of your specialist still get outplayed by St. Peter's University's main tank. And Spudinator there in kind of a panic was just running into the wall. And that is a very unfortunate thing to see mid fight. Nacho is not really hitting the shots on his Ash as well though. So if Kanishas can start to take advantage of that, that can be very helpful. But first, they're going to have to burn through the five ultimates that are going to come out of St. Peter's University. That's going to be two Nano Shatters back to back, but it's going to be Ricardo on the flank, only going to find one. Bob going to be committed too, so you see that St. Peter's, their DPS, they try to go for the flank rotation, and it does not work out in their favor. Flank doesn't work out at all, and Infamy picks up four. I, I, we were watching Ricardo that entire time in Infamy and the chaos of that fight picks up four. And as I say, the Reinhardt Specialist needs to step up. That's exactly what he's going to do for us. Another mistake from St. Peter's is they just used every ultimate they had. Now they've got a Valkyrie and they've got a grab, but they're going to have to make the magic happen to say the least. Spudinator gets way too aggressive once again, pays the price. That flash fan combo from McCree, an unstoppable one, but he's going to get rezzed as hubris gets, gets uh, refunded a little bit here and he can once again live another day. You see Special K has that grab on line 4% earlier than Rez, but here comes the one from Rez as well. So now it's going to come down to Special K. Here comes the grabs, here comes the dragons, and there's no defensible ultimate here. Able to pick up two, both for Rosaria and the Ana. Three and a half minutes still left on the clock for St. Peter's, but Canisius have finally found the opportunity to turn this fight around. They were able to turn that around to a great combination that grab dragons just such a tried and true formula but you saw spud Needer committing the tactical visor so they're not gonna have that ultimate online that would have been great if they had it for this fight just rain the soldier all the way behind for a flank now all they have is the shatter st right. peter's they've lost the last oh few fights God. but now they are starting to rebuild that ultimate bank just a little bit and not just swap over to the doomfist a fight or two ago if they wait for this his ultimate to come online, they might try to go for that Space Jam combo. You know, the Space Jam combo, a nasty one that I just wish we saw more often. Doomfist, one of my favorite characters to watch, and I know that's an unconventional opinion, but Nacho is putting in the work already. Spudinator, the first to go, I think, for the third fight in a row. Even the ones Kanishas had won, I believe Spudinator was the first person eliminated. Here comes Ricardo with another high dude, at least he's gonna come out quick. Infamy gonna shatter it, though, find a double, but a shatter from even from the Reinhardt from St. Peter's Povega, I believe, coming right back. Melamonster and Infamy, the first combo to go eliminate. 
eliminated by their counterparts there. Here comes Nachos just putting in the work out of this team. Frank and Bunny, she's going to fall next. Special pain not far behind. And if you're St. Peter's, you've got to feel pretty good. You're pushing into third point with about four minutes left on the clock. That interaction there looked very interesting when Povega hit the Shatter. Nachos, I believe, booped them up into the air so that Shatter wasn't on the, or the shield wasn't on the ground, so that Shatter is going to go up just a little bit, ended up hitting Infamy. They kept the Graviton search, so they don't have a true fire combo for it here, but if they use it aggressively, they can just try to run in and take this third point early on. Yeah, no doubt. So we talked about this last game with the Sombra early on uh, for Canisius, but we're going to have to see it come from St. Peter's now. You've got to use the grab. That's been held for three, four minutes, but now they're going to save it till the very end in an attempt to just win this fight convincingly, and it looks like it may work out as Zarya off the back of her own grab finds a triple elimination. The tagline for St. Peter's just rolling through all of Canisius. Right now, that's going to be a technical no, it's going to be a complete team kill. Three minutes left on the clock. St. Peter's, I mean, they barreled through that third point. Second moment, they struggled, but the first and third points were so good that they're still going to have about three minutes in the time. Make five seconds less than that, 255. So, got sold out, but they made the swaps they needed. They got Nachos on that Doomfist, and I'm talking about this earlier. Nachos on Lee Jong, pretty insane on this Echo. Has not really slowed down at all. The, the Ash definitely wasn't as good, but you're putting a projectile player onto a hitskin here, so it's a bit different mechanics there. Yeah, a hit scan and projectile, obviously two very different play styles for those DPS lineups. And we see Nachos, it, it really does depend on the hero a little bit, but they can still make it work with heroes they're uncomfortable on. That Ash, like I mentioned, was a little bit sloppy, but going up against Canisius, in particular Spudinator being as sloppy as they have been today, has made it much easier for Nachos to get aggressive and play any damage hero they really want to. My man Spudinator just trying their best right now, but I agree, the positioning has not been ideal, so maybe if they have that damage booster, the pocket from Frankenbunny can really pop up at the ultimate timing as well. Hasn't been as great, but Spudinator, maybe they'll turn it around here on the Widow. One thing that I found really interesting is, you know, we're talking about the Ash briefly, and if they had been not flanking on that one fight that Infamy just cleaned up on, that could have been a much faster time bank. Absolutely. Instead, um, they go for, you know, kind of a cheeky play. Doesn't work out in their favor. They lose one or two fights after that. And still, they regroup, they get it done, and now they're going to try their best at defending. Spudnator's going to try their best at clicking heads. Yeah, Spudnator's going to have to really show up here. Everybody kind of expects a Widowmaker at least at the beginning of an attack because if you're in spawn still, you can just go right back in and change. Might as well try to find that elimination early on. Spudnator unable to do so. It's also weird to see Widowmaker with 175 health still. But as we move in, 30% to the sites, which are very helpful. And those uh, those infrared sites, it kind of shows where the entire enemy team is. Great for communication. Povega, almost the first one to fall there. And the Widowmaker, can he just stick into it? But they're really going to have to start finding some eliminations. Oh, and as I say it, there we go. Ricardo, the first to fall. And if Canisius can clean up the back of this fight, they'll be able to cap just as fast as St. Peter's. Ricardo making the exact same mistake on that soldier who went to do, but a huge anti-A coming in from Celestwalk. It's going to force all of Canisius to back out. So despite getting that first pick, they weren't able to play the advantage. Yeah, they find the first pick, but Frank and Bunny's the second one and losing that main supporter. Yeah, just losing a Mercy in general is going to be disastrous for your team. Spudinator cannot make the magic happen. Nachos back on this hit scan, absolutely showing us where they belong. Finding three eliminations in that prolonged fight. St. Peter's, they took a they took a lost fight and they made it a one a one fight. Yeah, it was the one fight in the you know the terms of winning it and just the fact that it's only really been one overall fight so far it went on so long that already 120 is off the clock and meanwhile some peters they've built up almost four ultimates yeah spudinator right now just unable to find the value they need to on this widowmaker they can dump in the damage but they need to be finding these eliminations a lot faster Bobiga gonna drop the shatter able to pick up two and special k looks like they're gonna pay the price Ella monster not far behind and poor frank and money she's caught in the fray once again unable to do much she gets the resurrection onto her reaper but gives her life to do it canisius they're gonna have to make some swaps here yeah, the, the neither the Widow or the Reaper are getting the value they need, especially the Devil Nigiri on this Reaper. They've been trying to do these like flanks all around the side, but instead they're caught out every time. So they've only at 47% for their ult charge with two minutes left. So less than half the ult uh, bank charge in less than half that first four minutes. They need to get something done. They do have all of the other ultimates besides the DPS ones. Yeah, yep, and Spudinator just blinks into the back and is found out by Nachos right away. I don't even know where Melon Monster was for that to hit, but unfortunately Nachos finds yet yeah, another elimination just right now. I mean, St. Peter's doing a phenomenal job, but Nachos is very clearly the uh, damage dealer for this team. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're seeing them do 
pretty low on the hit scan roll. A lot better than they were on the Ash. I've always thought that Ash's firing feels a bit clunky no matter how good you are. So it looks like they're finally going to have something to push in here with Canisius. They have the Tangled. They have the Reaper in the back lane once again. Yeah, I mean, they've got a lot of combinations here. They can have Infamy hit a Shatter and Nano him off the back of it. They can grab and Nano Devil in the back line. Never mind, Devil's going to die once again, and they're just going to have to push into a 5 to 6. They're running out of time, and with a big Shatter down the drain, they're going to commit a Nano, but Infamy still just absolutely ripped the shreds. Canisius, they cannot make it happen right now. That Nano might be the difference maker, and it is. You're seeing that Infamy going to be taken out, but it's going to be Ricardo on the high ground with the Visor cleaning things up, and... Now it's looking very dire for Canisius. They will have the Death Blossom online shortly. They will have the Valkyrie. They already have the Graviton Surge. But time and time again, they've had this ultimate advantage and they just have not been able to execute in the right order. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. They just, they had the ult advantage for so many of these engagements. And while they don't have it anymore, they're going to have a lot of ultimates come online. But Devil, I mean, you've been playing Reaper for almost four minutes. And you haven't gotten his ultimate once. That's a pretty telltale sign that maybe you should be swapping off that hero. And there's the grab, there's the high noon, there's the nano. The death boss, I'm gonna be CC'd with that flashbang, and it is all St. Peter's in this final fight. Nacho's basically playing, I mean, a 1v6. The rest of St. Peter's doing a great job, but Nacho's just got four eliminations in that final fight and stunned two ultimates. So it was pretty unfortunate to see. Special K's grab got eaten as well. And St. Peter's just similar to RIT on King's Row just a little bit ago. Absolute masterclass. Full cap and then full hole. Even better than I would say on Lee John. Not giving up any point Absolutely. percentage for that first point is pretty impressive. And even they got stalled out a little bit on the second point. Probably due to this play right now from Infamy. Still had three I'm minutes, which is a great time there. Yeah. yeah. So this. Yeah, at least we didn't see it before because we the, we were on the McCree. So there's the one kill from the McCree, but here's just Infamy swinging away. Yeah, Nano to Ryan swinging away a terrifying thing to go up against, even as another Nano to Ryan. It comes up very difficult to who comes out on top of that engagement. But we said it already, St. Peter's University, a very convincing win. And as we are going to go into our third and possibly final map with the momentum we've seen from St. Peter's, we are going to take a quick break. So once again, these players can crack their fingers, run to the bathroom. I know I got to use the bathroom. I recommend you guys at home do the same. But we'll see you guys in just a minute. So don't go far. We got a lot of Overwatch for you.
What is going on, everybody, and welcome back. I am Septilence here with Jag to bring you what may possibly be the final map of Canisius College and St. Peter's University. It very well might be in. You know, we usually expect a lot of three Overwatch, as we like to call it here at EGF. There's just some teams that are at a bit better pace, a bit better skill level than some of the other ones. But, you know, coming into this matchup, we thought this would be a bit closer. So far, it seems like St. Peter's, they've just put themselves ahead early on. They are making the plays they need to on the back of their DPS lineup. They have just been astounding. Nacho has been putting it down on map. Ricardo sipping it up a lot more on Kings Row, really being solid on that hit scan roll. And Canisius College, they got to figure something out. They tried swapping things up. They tried swapping some players, switching roles for Kings Row. Same result. Just weren't yeah. able to get it done. It almost, it almost did them worse than on Li Zhang Tao because Li Zhang came down to the wire for almost both maps where King's Row was a complete 3 0. So it was something that definitely didn't look good. And while this isn't related to Overwatch at all, every time we say Ricardo, I think of that character from Adventure Time, that really creepy little heart guy. And I, I just can't stop thinking about him. But as we move into this final map that's going to be Temple of Anubis, Ganesha's College is going to have to do something very different. And that's something I don't like to, I don't like to talk poorly on individual players, but that's something. Something might be get, get Spudinator off that Soldier 76. Or at least, you know, give the Soldier 76 some more resources. You're seeing that True. they are getting True. some damage done, but a lot of the times they're putting themselves in not great positioning. A very aggressive set on the Widowmaker as well. And I'm thinking, man, if there is a Mercy there, that might be winnable. That might be livable. You might get a few picks and be able to get out of your life, build up your Infrasites, and then just use them and figure out where everyone else is, or build up the Textual Advisor, take more high ground and use it from be uh, behind. But they're just a little bit too out in the open, not enough help from the rest of the team. And Jesus College, they're going to stick with that lineup they just ran, except for Tiger's going to be back in the lineup. So a few more. Uh, Infamy out. Yeah, special key back on the Reinhardt. Tiger in an off tank. But Nelly Geary not going back to that support role. So swifting or sticking to that Reaper. And I'd say, if anything, maybe the Reaper was the problem in King's Row. Took an entire four minutes to build up a Death Blossom. Yeah, Death Blossom then got immediately flashbanged and found zero value. And it's going to be very difficult for Devil to find even more value on Reaper on defense of Temple of Anubis. That's going to be a very difficult thing to work with. And it's going to be difficult to build the momentum to play Reaper effectively. But Devil being forced into this DPS slot, this might be the only character they feel comfortable with. It might be what they need, though, because you're seeing right now. They're trying to play this high ground. They're trying to play there with the dive tanks. Instead, see the Wrecking Ball, very smart. He's just going to cut that out and go straight to the point, try to force the rotation, and hit the Pile Driver right there on the high ground. Again, chooses that Pile Driver over knocking the enemy team off the high ground, which can be an effective play, and it looks like it worked out very well here as Rez was able to clean up the back of it, able to take Tiger out of the engagement in a spot where it's an unrestable position. Mela Monster the next to fall, so already a 3v6 in favor of St. Peter's as Nacho is just on a rampage. Once again, this McCree has been nothing but completely nasty against Kanisha's College. It doesn't matter what they play, whether it's the Echo, the McCree. Uh, I think they were on something else at one point. Can't remember off the top of my head, but just complete dominance. Devil going to be alive for just a little bit before falling in a great chase by Ricardo to secure that point. Only one minute off the clock. There's going to be a great sub level potential here for St. Peter's, especially by the fact that they've almost built up that Valkyrie in Primal Reach. Yeah, absolutely. Snowball potential obviously gets a little bit harder after those changes came in months ago, where the respawn timer for the defending team is much, much lower after the initial cap. And that's going to make it even harder, as Boviga is going to be eliminated right away. St. Peter's, they could push into a 5v6, but with five and a half minutes on the clock, you don't really have to. Yeah, they can take their time, they can wait for those ultimates to be built up, just so a little bit of poke, a little bit of playing with that passive and just letting them passively be built. But I don't think they want to do that. I don't think they want to cap with less than at least four minutes. So right now they're just waiting for Nauseas to get that high noon, and once they have that online, I think that's going to be their go key. You're going to see though, early on, they need the Wrecking Ball to back out just for a second. Yeah, they need the Wrecking Ball to just back up and catch his breath, even if it's for a moment. But right now, they're pushing around through this far side, and it's one that works out effectively with maybe a Brawl comp, but pushing it on the Ball Winston, pushing it to a Roadhog nonetheless, probably not your best call, but St. Peter's, like I said, they've still got plenty of time to make the magic happen, just now going underneath that five-minute timer. In the meantime, Tiger shot over to the Roadhog, and it's found two oh. very high value of three now, actually. It's a great... Swap again, it doesn't work very well with the Reinhardt, just like it didn't work very well with the Winston on Lee Jong. But you're not doing it for that synergy, you're doing it to counter that Wrecking Ball is in a roll in and out, and it's working out better than it has so far on that previous control map. 
Yeah, this is a relatively good Roadhog point. There's not a lot of places to hide from that long hook distance. And Tiger just essentially playing a third DPS role, which might be valuable, as we mentioned. The DPS from Canisius haven't been on their A game today. But St. Peter's, they're going to be pushing in with a team old Apocalypse here. We're actually quite close to a full old Apocalypse if Devil and Tiger get their ultimates before. Nope, and there we go. Sell out spot Canisius full lesson. It's hooked right out of it by Tiger, who's just hitting hook after hook out of St. Peter's. It is arguably the sole reason they haven't been able to touch this point. And that was a high name being committed. First by Nodges, almost found the Mercy out, but Tranky Money was in the belt. Now he was taking out, but that's going to be the whole hog offline. Ricardo, they might be looking for the Seth Blossom. If they can hit a big one, this might be a full cap here. That's Blossom 15, massive, or it did not matter at all, but no, it's going to be big enough as the rest of St. Peter's cleans up off the back of it. Three minutes, 40 left. Tiger's going to be the next one to return, but all of St. Peter's is there to give them a run for their money. Take a breather just to stall the point for one or two more seconds. Nachos, is, excuse me, no, Spud Mater just trying to touch the point, but Ricardo standing in spawn, gonna find a triple kill on the back of this. Three and a half minutes on the clock right now. Mellow Monster on the Lucio, desperate to stall the point, but unable to do much. Otherwise, Min Min finds the resurrection on Ricardo, who went down just moments ago. The Shatter finally coming out from Special K, trying to clean up off the back of anything that they can. But Canisius, they've got to come on top of this. Tiger with the with the whole hog, trying to make that happen. Able to find a double kill in the madness. The back of the May swap as well from Spudnator. And somehow, Canisius, they stabilize. You know, 95% were able to get onto the point at the last second. It was the whole hog that was their saving grace. Devil Nagiri had that Death Blossom before they died. Tried using it on top of Ricardo's Death Blossom. It did not work out. I thought that was going to be lights out for Kinesis on this defense, but they were able to bring it back for just a little bit. You see where that ticker is 95%, but it's going to go back down to 66.7. So, still need one third of the point to win it and hit peters they might have used an entire all bank before but now they've built up an entire another one yeah that's kind of crazy to see that they lost that fight and were able to almost get all three point caps so now they've got six more ultimates to push in here comes the minefield early on a great space maker and several of them are caught right in the middle of it we see valkyrie and oh ricardo just gonna clean up the team right away there goes a quadruple making it quintuple do we see the team kill here is a special K just trying to make it out no that's gonna be a team kill in favor of saint peter's university two minutes and 12 seconds left on the clock canisius college they gave a solid defense but the question is can they attack even stronger that is going to be the question they need to have a solid attack because if they do not then that's going to be the end of this series you see ricardo here playing the advantage getting a very nice death blossom and there's a death blossom from devil and here right on top of it it's a risky play it can work out sometimes in your favor but going in already at a little bit less than half health with the death blossom you're never going to come out on, on that battle on top yeah absolutely and tiger just an absolute powerhouse on that roadhog just made a world of difference for canisius arguably like i said the reason they won two or three of those defensive holds against saint peter's but as they push in like i already said a moment ago can they push in better than we've seen from them all evening i agree tiger on that roadhog seems like they really want to play that off tank and i see why it's a great counter but also seems to be what they might be most uh you know comfortable with best at something like that you always have your favorite picks in your role i know as a flex support i love zenyatta more than anything else so if i can play zen i will try to play it so any excuse is a good reason to play your favorite characters not going to be running it this time though they're going to be going for a ryan zarya with a pharmacy that this is very intriguing because there is no hit scan right now coming out for St. Peter's. The only long range damage they really have is the Ana. The May can be worthwhile, but it's very hard to hit those alternate fire shots, that icicle. So this might actually give Kinesis oh, a huge edge. Yeah, absolutely. Nachos, the one time they're not playing McCree is arguably the most important time they should be. But two alternate fires from Ricardo connect right away, almost exploding her out of the fight. I'm sure he's thanking the heavens for that mercy pocket, keeping him alive. Gonna look for that concussion mine off the bridge. Able to find none of them as they all maintain the high ground. But Nachos falling underneath the bridge. They've got to find that elimination quick. Two minutes and 12 seconds is a tall order to fill, and they've got to get eliminating St. Peter's right away. See the rotation coming out right now from St. Peter's. They see that the McCree is kind of separated. The charge is going to come in on the other side from Special K. Now they're stuck in a room. The spam damage isn't going to be enough for Spudnator to take anyone down. This is that was a great play by Ricardo, able to find that headshot onto the Faro. Yeah, the spamage from Junkrat there are going to be much more valuable than the spamage you're going to find from a long distance Fara. The direct shots are really where Fara gets to shine. And oh, the flash fan almost finding the elimination onto Nacho, but somehow he falls and stays alive if it's even for a moment. St. Peter's, they've got, or, excuse me, 
Oh my goodness, control of the point, and they just gotta make the magic happen now. But Canisius, they've got the better positioning, they've got the high ground, which is always the place you wanna be. The question is, can they find the follow-up damage they're looking for? Almost zoning out Ricardo there, went way too deep in enemy backlines, but able to get out due to the Maywall and the May Freeze. Now you see that they have the Valkyrie from Vinman, they have the tire oh. from Notches, almost gets stunned and killed. The accretion not gonna be enough to take out this Junkra. This Junkra tire has got the potential to be big, and it sure is able to find a triple kill. They get a quad off the back of a mine right into Special K's back there. It's gonna be a quadruple kill for Nachos, who, like I said earlier, and I still stand by, is the player to watch in this matchup because they have been steamrolling since the first second of this series. They have been seeing rolling. It doesn't matter what they play. Every hero has been class, eh, maybe except for Ash. Ash was a bit back and forth, but it's all right to have one off hero. Nisha's college. They need to make sure they don't have an off ultimate moment. They have that barrage. They have the Valkyrie. They have the Nano. Is it worth committing all three of those ultimates to try to clean up this fight? We're gonna find out what they decide in the second. Yeah, they're sure gonna have to try, but I mean, there's a freeze, there's a sleep, and there's an accretion to try to get rid of that barrage. So Spudminator's gonna have to time it very well, maybe even find an elimination onto one of those three beforehand, just to even guarantee the ability. And there's the elimination as I talk about it. That's gonna be huge for Canisius if Spudminator doesn't get taken out by an eye here. Yeah, not just to stay alive, wait, and drive back in. I think it's gonna come out any second oh, now. They're waiting for that angle. The Geary, though, gonna be the one actually using the all as Spudminator fell. Now they're gonna res it. But the Resurrection comes back through, it's going to be a triple kill for Canisius. This is the final opportunity they've needed. They're going to find Poviga this deep in the fight, and Min Min, she's somehow still alive, but she's going to get caught by that hammer. You can only avoid death for so long when you're standing on his doorstep. And they committed everything except for the Barrage, which I believed was going to be the ultimate they wanted to use first. Instead, it's what they kept for last. St. Peter's, though, they only committed two ultimates there. They committed the Nino, they committed the Shatter, but they still have everything else on line. So, as long as they aren't wiped away by this Barrage, and as long as they don't use everything here in this fight, they still can hold out for a bit longer. Meanwhile, I was looking at the Barrage, but Tiger almost has that Graviton Surge, so... That combo could be too much for St. Peter's to handle. I was just about to say that as well. Tiger has that grab online or will in a moment and grab grab barrage, assuming the Farah isn't slept or eliminated, is just lethal to say the very least. That will wipe a team out in the blink of an eye. The question is, can they be coordinated with positioning well enough to do it? Because Tiger is in a great position to hit a grab, but Spudmate are currently nowhere to be found. Yeah, so I think they're trying to go all the way behind. I'm not sure they see them. It really comes down to if you can get Rez can eat this Graviton Search, but you can't eat it if you're in the Gravitic Flux. And Nachos makes it even harder as he takes out the Pharmacy with the tire. I believe that's the third attempt we've seen at a Junkrat trying to take out a Pharmacy today, but the first successful one we've seen coming out of Nachos, which is no surprise. I could not praise this current DPS player enough. Canisius, three minutes on the clock. In theory, they can still cap with equal or more time than St. Peter's, but they've got to be pushing in right here, right now to beat that. They have five ultimates too. They didn't commit anything there in that loss fight, so good perseverance by them, good preservation is what I was trying to say. Now they have a lot to use, but they're just getting a bit too sloppy with it. I mean, we talked about the thing you can't hold on to ultimates forever. You sometimes need to swap off gears, change how things are done. Farad, not great here because that ceiling box, the sky box, is not very good. You see her just go up and immediately hit something, and now she's gonna drop down. Yeah, the Farah doesn't have the distance you need to really capitalize off of a barrage and keeps splitting away from the rest of the team, which I'm not sure is the call. I understand the idea, the ideology of not wanting a Farah in that tight corridor. Maybe the rest of the team shouldn't be in that corridor either. A Spudnator, again, is the first person eliminated. There's going to be a big shatter. The guys are going to fall up. The all coming out. I think they're going to be in St. Peter's favor. That Blizzard might have sealed the deal. Yeah, the Blizzard absolutely sealed the deal. Ricardo got to rain havoc. He's going to rain a little bit of justice from his own from his own pockets here in Spudnator still holding on to that barrage. Canisius College, they've got to remember to press Q because they've been holding on to these ultimates for what feels like an eternity. The other thing for Canisius College is, again, you're still getting things out of St. Peter's. They came in a lot to win that fight. Now all they have is the Valkyrie. So that's quite going to swap onto the Baptiste. So no more Ana, no more Nino, but they do have that immortality field. So we'll see if that's going to be enough to keep them sustained during this barrage. You know, Canisius just they still have four ultimates. They committed their tank ults there, but they have everything else online if they can hit Q, and that's a big if considering that they've been very slow on it. They could still get this fight one in that point capped. Absolutely, and we see the sellout squad swap to the Baptiste, which is very important because when you're barraging a tank, every rocket counts. So that immortality field might be able to keep them alive for just a moment longer than normal devil. Now looking for a bit of a cheeky oh. 
All right, Spudnator full commits the barrage they've been holding for four minutes into a Baptiste, which was, in my opinion, could not have been the more wrong play. But now we see Kanishas, they're pushing in. Here's the Valkyrie, here's the Nano Boost. They've still got the Tiger and the Shatter. The Devil take it out before the High Nukes can come online. Special K able to pick up an elimination, and but Hodiga gonna be brought right back up. Nachos finds Tiger. Kanishas, they've got 40 seconds and now zero ultimates. You've got St. Peter's, you've got a massive spawn advantage, you've got Junkrat, who is constantly bloodthirsty. That was a great play there from Min Min and Cello Squad on that point. The there's a res coming in from Min Min. They are out in the open trying to get their Reinhardt back online, and the immortality field being committed to make sure that res came through really helped clean up that fight. Nacho's already more than halfway to another tire. This is just crazy. The rip tire is coming online every fight. Yeah, at this point, Nacho is, he knows he owns this lobby. It is Nacho's world and Kanisha's college. They're just the team unfortunate enough to be living in it. Right now, another tire online. I wouldn't be surprised to see him pull it just for the giggles because he has it again. Here it comes. Even a single elimination secures a win here for this team. And Frank and Bunny is going to be the one to fall. Kanisha's college, they've got the numbers, but they needed to be on point. They needed the first take for these numbers to matter. As St. Peter's there, just ripping them apart once again. A massive spawn advantage at the end of the day is what this is all about. And Kanisha's, they've got to find these eliminations. Right now, St. Peter's, they're just standing there, just making sure that Kanisha doesn't get any value. Yeah, Special K was just too scared to go in because they were so weak with Lucio. He was not enough to sustain a tank that plays aggressive. The amplification matrix garage door coming in just at the end to cure things up. And St. Peter's bouncing back from a loss last week to be able to beat a team at the same record this decisively, it's going to give them a lot of confidence going into that last week of the fall split. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't know what St. Peter's losses have been, but, you know, if they're a school like Marist or RIT, of course you're going to be losing to them because those teams right now seem undefeatable with the way they so St. Peter's, they may have lost a couple, but very clearly they are a capable team to say the least. And it was Tamaris, exactly. So yeah, losing to the top of the table, that's not a bad thing. We talked about Canisius. They lost to Quinnipiac last week in there, you know, right up below that top three. They're like four or five, so still in that top five sphere. So, you know, they might not be at the tippy top, but still, if you're a team like St. Peter's, you can compete in the upper mid table and you know once you go into that spring split once you end that fall split if you can continue to improve and you know grind the game and just gel together as a squad maybe later on you can contest to those top teams yeah absolutely and with a very convincing 3-0 victory for st peter's we're now going to jump to a quick break get our interviewee in here and we'll talk about the game a little bit more then so don't go far we'll be right back
Welcome back, everybody. We are here at the end of a very convincing win from St. Peter's University, and we are here with Support Player Sellout Squad. How are you, my friend? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. How are you guys? We are doing all right. Thank you so much for asking. So you guys, you know, you you lost last week, but your record is still very good. You know, you're in the middle between these teams, and you come out on top of a win here tonight against Canisius, and a, a very effective one at that, a 3-0. So how do you think that kind of helps your momentum moving forward? Uh, moving forward, well, I, I can say the team feels really good, especially about, like, a win like this one. You know, like, after you have, like, a hard week, a hard loss, you, it's easy to get down, it's easy to get, like, tilted and stuff, but, you know, we, we rally together as a team, you know, we talk about stuff, and uh, we to, to come back and, like, have, like, a performance like this one to show that, you know, like, you know, maybe, like, the last week was just, like, a fluke or something, you know, we can, like, bounce back and come back stronger. It feels really nice, honestly, and I think we're going to carry the momentum moving forward. Awesome. I'm so glad to hear such a positive mindset. That's always awesome to see in the community. But now I'm going to throw you over to Jag, who I'm sure has got a couple questions for you. Yeah, it's great to bounce back with a win like that. I know Maris is a pretty, or yeah, Maris is a pretty tough opponent. So no shame in losing to them. I'm sure you'll try to get back at it again if you have oh, a rematch. Definitely. I want to ask, so you were talking about this during the break. You and Canisius, you, the teams are friends, St. Peter's and Canisius. So does that change kind of how you play the game at all? Like, Does it feel better to be playing uh, in a more friendly environment, or is it still just competition, like you want to win? Honestly, it feels a lot more fun, because we, we've played with Kinesis before, and we know their players, especially Spud. Uh, I love Spud, honestly. Spudinator, he's like one of the kindest people here in like the whole like circuit. And it's just a lot more fun when you're playing against them because you know there's like no like bad feelings you you know it's just like it's just like for laughs and stuff <laughs> and like towards the end we started throwing around uh some like for fun picks like uh i think goonman uh nachos popped out the uh the junk rat and in like the third point it, it was for fun it, it's fun it's fun so i i gotta ask about nachos because uh me and seps once we were watching this and we we're like this guy is cracked. He is insane on That's the echoes and on the junk rat. I gotta ask, what is he like in the comms? Like, was he freaking out about how good his plays were? Or was he just kind of like, all right, guys, let's just finish oh, this out. Let's win it's these fights. It's so weird. He's like the co complete opposite. Like, he's so calm about everything. When he <laughs> when he makes a good play, he'll like acknowledge it. He's like, yo, I'm so cracked. It, 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 he'll be like, I'm insane, guys. But like, besides that, he's usually like like really calm and uh, uh, he he's like really good at shot calling too. So we, we usually just listen to him and uh, Min Min's calls the whole time. Yeah, Min Min doing a great job on that support role. Mm -hmm. But that's it for me. So, Sebus, unless you got anything else, let's wrap up this interview. Yeah, no, my last thing is I'm just so glad to see such positivity in the esports community. Absolutely warms my heart. So it's great to hear that there's such a good bond between these two teams, even in that competitive sense. But those are all the questions we have for you tonight, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. And please extend our congratulations to your team as a whole. You guys got that win, and you guys have some great momentum moving forward. So best of luck to you for the rest of the series. Oh, thank you. I hope you guys have a nice night, too, with the broadcast and stuff. Aww, thank you so thank much. You. We'll see you later. Have a good one. Bye, guys. And that, everybody, we are going to call this game an end. Um, everybody, jump on over to EGF Overwatch, our second channel, as Niagara takes on Marist. And this channel is going to be on break till 9. So if you want to keep watching, hop over there. There's going to be plenty of games for you cast by our good friends, I believe, Dryan and Sir Waltham. So they'll be over there, and I'll probably hop in that chat as well. But if you want to see more Overwatch on main channel, there's going to be another game coming up at 9. It'll be Jag and not me. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name at the moment. It's, but uh, it's with Rich Rad. Rich Rad. So it'll be Jag and Rich Rad then. But this is my final game for the evening. And for the time being, this will be Septilence and Jag signing off. We'll see you guys later.
And welcome back, friends, as we continue on for the Electronic Gaming Federation Overwatch Fall Split. We've already had a couple of great matches to start off this evening, as now we're going to be the tail end for the night. I'm Rich Rad here with Jag, and we are going to continue bringing this action. How you doing, my friend? I am doing great, Rich Rad. Thanks for being here. It's going to be a great night. As you said, already a lot of great games earlier today. Two more to finish out the docket. And first up, it's going to be Quinnipiac versus Siena Collagens. This is kind of a tale of one team that's doing pretty well this season and one team that is near the bottom of the table. But we've already seen some upsets today. Maybe another one is in the cards now. And I mean, again, this is week seven of eight for the fall split. So we're getting towards the tail end of it where you've got to lay all on the line. And I'm really looking forward to get this first match off. Like you said, Quinnipiac, we actually have seen a, a little bit of that more so before, even in like the Mac Esports. A lot of these colleges have been involved with it earlier in the year. So now they're coming back in this fall segment from EGF and really looking forward to seeing how they're going to be able to close out this year. Yeah. And Quinnipiac, they've only lost one game, and that was Tamaris, one of the powerhouses here in EGF. One of the only teams that's left undefeated. They're currently 6-0, 7-0, oh, actually. They just had a great game against Niagara on the other channel, so no shame there in losing that one matchup. Meanwhile, Sienna, they have just... It's been a tough time for them this season, but it's never too late to get back in it. As you said, this is only the end of the fall split. You're still looking towards spring, the, uh, the collegiate championships in the spring afterwards. So, you know, if you're going to start building a momentum, what a great way it would be to start it right now of a huge win. And this is a great segment of Overwatch as well to really have that type of, you know, ebb and flow coming through. I mean, I would honestly say that this is probably one of the most liquid that we've had for type of compositions and hero selections and what you can bring into play, how you can utilize it. There's such a vast majority that we've seen, you know, coming out on all different walks of life from different maps as well. I mean, even in Tespa that we've recently seen, there's even some Bastion play, there's Junkrat play, there's Ash play, even 76 spreading their legs and getting a little bit out there and just stretching them out to run around as quickly as possible to get some pickoffs. So honestly, when it comes to the composition, I'm really excited to see what we're having this evening. And looking in your background, I see the Orissa painting. Orissa has kind of <laughs> come back in. Double shield is back. Which I'm I sure. am happy about. And uh, if you've seen the clip, Samito is really happy about it as well. But there is a lot of variation, as you said. Uh, you had the kind of brawly dive for a while with the dive tanks and then the Sombra Reaper. That's kind of out. No one's really running that anymore. Sigma Hog is viable. You can run the Wrecking Ball with a Sigma or with a Roadhog. So you can uh, get some of that Wrecking Ball Roadhog action. And then Double Shield has come in. And Brawl still viable on certain maps like King's Row and then certain control points like on one of the map we're going to be going to first. That is Lee Jong Tower. So we could be seeing that on Control Center, maybe Night Market as well. Just in other collegiate uh, tournaments, there's a lot of variation teams. They're going to play to their strengths. They're not going to worry too much about what's meta, quote-unquote, and what's not. And that's honestly one of the biggest things that... I've noticed more so as we continue to get into the collegiate, there's a lot more respect for wanting to play what you know and what you're comfortable on than wanting to strictly stick towards that meta. And another thing to really focus on with Li Zhang Tower being this first map, there's a lot of verticality to the two of them, most specifically outside of uh, Control Center, where it's a little bit more boxed in. Echo has been also very relevant. There's been a lot of usage of Echo most recently where you could duplicate your, you know, a, another tank line, basically anything, I'll be honest. I mean, we've seen some you know, double Brigitas or, you know, double Bastions or a couple of other, you know, bring in an extra Sigma in there for that quick, very, very high intense, useful flux that can just completely change and shift the fight. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. If we have some of that come out this evening. And Echo, as you said, in a great state, you can combine that with a Tracer, run a lot of really up close, just 
really brutal damage. It's not as much as Reaper as a tank buster, but with an Echo, you throw in those sticky grenades, use your beam that cuts down people when they're at half health, have the Tracer run in and help finish that off, and run it with a Wrecking Ball. It's a very fast, chaotic comp, and it's interesting you bring up Brigida because with these changes that we had on the new patch today, she might not be played as much. Mm -hmm. There was a new patch earlier this week. It changed the amplification matrix of Baptiste, turned that, that was square mm -hmm. into a garage door. So <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty wide, uh, pretty thick, some might say. But now Brigida, she's been nerfed once again. That health buff she had, it's gone. Now back at 200, there were some other quality of life changes the on and aid now goes through fully healed teammates as a symmetry you can destroy your teleporter if you're dead same thing with torbin with the turret uh, hanzo can manually kill the or cancel those storm arrows so it's a lot of different little things coming into today's matchup and as a team how do you adapt to that you've practiced on a different patch for a little while and now those little differences could make a big difference in a matchup like this well and especially because you touched on the support line most specifically as we did have in those patch notes because the tracer has been very very profound in making some combat shifts onto the support line because really a lot of the time to combat that i mean if you're on the the ana you're very vulnerable the sleep dart is very challenging to land the immortality feel has become a lot more relevant but the fact that you have a hard crowd control from the brigita was so critical to try and shut down that heavy mobility and get a really really quick engagement onto the tracer with that 150 health before the recall so you're very correct when it comes to this change is it going to be something where you look elsewhere in your composition to try and get that crowd control necessary to potentially bring down a tracer if we do see it and not allow it to just flourish in the back, which has been a very large nuisance for some high level play. Well, we're going to see if that happens, what they're going to run in a little bit. We're still waiting for one in the lobby mm -hmm. from Sienna. So we're going to take a very quick break. We'll be back in a little bit with the first map of this series.
Hello and welcome back, friends, as we do continue on. The break was short, and we promised it because we wanted to get this action underway as quickly as possible. The technical difficulties have managed to come to an end as we're entering into our first round of this control map, and it is going to be Control Center, Jag. And we talked about this right before the break. This is very well known for Brawl compositions, and so far, looks like we're going to get different variations of it. Ryan from both sides, but the... Off tank's a bit different for Sienna. They're going to run that Diva Quinnipiac. They want to run the Zarya and the Bubbles versus the Diva Matrix. That can make a world of difference in abilities. But we're going to find out which one is the better call. Both teams rushing to the point. And you can see that the Junkrat has been very, very highly selected recently. Combined with the May will be also very nice to get a nice separation in the composition that you're gonna have from Quinnipiac. A lot of damage coming through up front, but it is going to be far superior for Quinnipiac with this Hanzo in the back line. Getting an early pick, also forcing out the res here from Sienna. This follow-up needs to be very swift from Quinnipiac to take advantage of Sienna and looks now to follow up to take this point. That's a big freeze on the Firewolf. They're losing their main tank, but still, they're going to get the first pep on the side of Quinnipiac. There's the res of their own, so the Reinhardt falling isn't going to be anything. And now, you see Quinnipiac, they're just going to finish this fight up. And look at Grub already at that high noon percentage. That's pretty quickly built. Yeah, and just being ready to use that, whether it's for looking for the single picks in the back line or having it more so as just zoning or diverting several members from Sienna away, it's still going to be valuable. You've got the Remek now going to come back in from the Diva play. There's the triple kill. So I said one or two or separate the team, but getting both supports and a Junkrat in the mix is definitely worthwhile. Earlier on, Firewolf had committed the Shatter, ended up giving their life for it, but that flank from Grub still saves the team. Now you're seeing Sienna, they're making some swaps. They swapped CJ Pal onto the Reaper. They swapped their off tank to a Winston, so it's double shield, but not a double shield that we're used to. Grab gonna now come out up front, managing to lock down one, as you've got a sound barrier to follow through by Sock from Sienna to give some stability here. But with this change up in the tank line, and well, there's actually a wall with a nice charge coming through to get a follow-up locking down one member after another but despite those couple of picks from sienna quinnipiac is managing to recover just quite smoothly these fights have been so fast and furious there has not been one total like recontest or total re-engage these teams have not been able to group up finally we're seeing the 66 action come back and grub again has this high noon online the dragons and the are going to be committed, and they're both going to find one pick. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you just continually reset Sienna right now when you're at 80%, I mean, this is going to be a challenge in and of itself to get back to even come back to compete. You've got Vigar going in with that Valkyrie just to keep the team alive, but it's going to come up short. Norris had to throw themselves off the map, and this is last by territory. 91% on the clock, and anyone from Sienna even touch this point. I mean, it's going to have to be all on Sock managing to get there with the Lucio, but being completely taken control of towards this front line, giving assistance to the team. The overtime does at least managed to occur with the Winston play in the back line, but a swiftness once again by Quinnipiac, clearing off the last few members and taking this first round quite convincingly. Under to zero does not get any better than that. And most of those fights happen right at Sienna's spawn point. They weren't able to get out of there when they were. The fights were all over the place. They were back and forth, but Quinnipiac, they were just able to regroup enough to stabilize in some big plays from the DPS to keep the fights in their favor. Grub in particular doing great with those high noons. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the biggest challenge right now is just Sienna managing to find an early pick advantage where you've got Quinnipiac finding value just honestly from either the Hanzo play as we saw or the McCree before any sort of stable positioning comes about for Sienna. And now you're going to have this Tracer come out as well, which is going to cause even more mayhem for Sienna to even maintain. Meanwhile, Sienna, they're running the Roadhog Reinhardt. This is not a composition you see very often. The synergy between the tanks is not great, but you can do a great job at zoning enemies out and broccoli <laughs> off the map already. This is looking great for Sienna. Yeah, I mean, there was a little bit of a mishap. I think underestimated the distance of the wall to the skates for the Lucio in that round. You've got at least this res attempting to keep Quinnipiac back into this fight. Broccoli should be able to have the opportunity of getting back into this fight now that the spawn has come through with the heavy movement speed. But these numbers advantage going in favor of Sienna should allow them to clean up the remaining members, especially after that Mercy goes down. And this will be Sienna managing to get some percent on the board. 
getting some percent for the first time on Li Jung Tower. And more importantly, they're building up alt as well, and they're getting great hooks. Seth 3, that's another great hook onto the Lucio. So Broccoli gonna die early on once again. And Seth 3 getting so close to that whole hog. They could try to use that just to boot the rest of Quinnipiac off of that point. You see, it's right around that open area. You can see the Reaper hiding in the back. Sienna does have the Dragon Strike come through, so that's going to leave the Hanzo vulnerable. If there's a follow-up afterwards, does manage to skirt over the gap near the support play to survive. So the numbers advantage instantly favoring Quinnipiac and Sienna a little bit caught off guard there. Yeah, they weren't ready for that engage. They had good positioning, but just throwing your Reaper kind of out there in the middle of nowhere when you need them to be contesting the front line isn't great. Wasn't able to find that kill onto the Hanzo. A great use of that leave ability just to jump over that little uh, area that they can fall into and die. Now, Sienna, they have ultimates, but can they use them wisely? And oh, already two kills coming up from Jack. Yeah, especially getting rid of the support, making sure that it is only going to rely on Tasak, which is having a challenge in and of itself just main healing. I mean, again, Lucio's never been able to fill those shoes, but, you know, has to fall back and looks to try and not give any more percentage in ult. Not sure if that was purposeful or not. Broccoli, or Cookie, actually, using that Valkyrie very early on. Now they're not going to have that Mercy ult for the next fight. They do stall out for a little bit longer and now Grub looking at that back line with the pulse bomb he does go for the support tosses it but the movement speed from the lucio is going to allow the evade to come through so it won't gain much value only tickling damage which will be easily healed through is once again another dragon strike here prepped and ready looking towards white room stacked up and lined for that use but there is a sock managing to put on a quick shield with that sound barrier. Olha going to be committed to this though, trying to maneuver a lot of Quinnipiac off this point, but regardless, they are relentless in their defensive hold and managing to clean this up even with the death blossom being committed by Sienna. The sound barrier coming out a little late for Broccoli, but it doesn't matter. The sustain was there for Quinnipiac, and now they've turned this point around one fight territory. They have Flaney's Graviton Surge. Maybe Grubbit will be able to build up a Pulse Bomb and they can use a huge combo play there. But on the other side, you see Nourish, they have that Rip Tire ready to roll and Broccoli committing the Sound Barrier already. They're not going to have any extra shields to protect them. You could just see so much damage and pick potential right now coming out from Quinnipiac over the side. It's oh no, you're dirty. Just stop it. Dragon Strike going to come out as well. Having to evade once. Oh my goodness, evades again over the riverbank and manages to survive. I just don't even believe this right now. The ability for this Hanzo coming out from Panipiac is so clean, and just the assistance to keep them alive is insane. When you ride the tube in London, they say mine the gap, and that's exactly what this Hanzo is doing, is just able to get right over it. The Graviton Surge not gonna find anything, but it's not gonna matter. The follow-up is there. The Shatter's not gonna be enough, and Panipiac, they are gonna take Lee Jong Tower two to zero a great start for this team that's already established themselves as a top dog in egfc that mind the gap in the tube i was i was on the tube once when i was out in london so i i definitely can relate to that comment <laughs> as well, it's a great a look, city right it is it really really is i love my time there for, for the short while and let's you know speaking of short time to enjoy you've got grub here with a triple on this high noon managing to clean up gets the quad afterwards takes it away from the dragon strike I mean, honestly, it's a very dominant play that we've seen come out already by Quinnipiac. Again, we talk highly about Control being a little bit more of its own beast in and of itself, but with how they're playing, they could look very strong going into this next one. I think one of the most amazing things about that Hanzo play was they weren't even looking for the Grav Dragon most of the time. They were just throwing it in there. They were using the Sonar Arrow very like smartly just to be able to figure out where the team was and throw it as a line drive right down the middle you saw at the end they used it to find out the junk rat who was in the rip tire animation so they were very vulnerable the rip tire got one but immediately retreated out so that's a great trait by the han zone talking about london a little bit more that's actually we're going to be headed to next because we're going to king's row for our second map I mean, we just segue this whole show, friends. I mean, we're just all perp. We've got this all in the bag outside of technical difficulties, which is not our control. But we can get this set up as nicely and stacked like a pretty deck of cards. But yes, with King's Row now coming out, we've seen also a lot of variation to this. There are even some ridiculous strats we've seen by some of the top names that we've had. Northwood managing to play the Bastion on top of Statue on the defensive side. So I just always look forward to King's Row because there could just be 
literally anything coming out. It's a plethora of opportunity, and I can't wait to see how we're going to have Sienna try and compete against a very dominant Quinnipiac. It's just earlier we saw Rochester Institute of Technology run the most bizarre composition I've ever seen and executed to perfection. They ran a Sim Doomfist, used that Sim Teleporter to the top of the statue to enable the Doomfist to get all the way to the high ground and got two kills immediately with the punch. So that was a great play. They also are running the Wrecking Ball with that composition and a Reinhardt. Immediately they swap to a more traditional hack fist composition but stuff like that it catches your opponent so off guard and when it works you feel like a million bucks it makes your team synergy and confidence sky high so i'd love to see something more um just looking at the tier two scene i was watching uh enharar in the ebc emea majors a few days ago were casting them and they just ran the wrecking ball zarya and they ran it to perfection even the wrecking ball not normally ran on king's row if you can execute it to such a high level why not go for it? It's about those comfort picks sometimes. It really is. And again, a lot of the time you don't see the Wrecking Ball as much, at least more specifically on that map, just because of the typical angles, how you kind of play the initial point, especially moving through the streets phase, because honestly, the Wrecking Ball holds a lot of value where in comparison to, let's say, something like the Winston more specifically, when you kind of run that composition, especially if you want to pair it with Zarya, is that even if you do get stunned a couple of times, you still have that shield. You still have high mobility and escapability. Whereas with the Winston, when you go in for that type of dive composition, it has to be so much more refined and coordinated to make sure that you don't get caught out because with the bubble being used and you not getting that jump up quick enough, you can really be vulnerable. So, I mean, again, that's why there's kind of this ebb and flow with individuals choosing the Winston to the Zarya or the Wrecking Ball to the Zarya. And, you know, King's Row is one of those rare occasions where we see the Wrecking Ball. I think it comes down to, are you going to play more mechanically, individually, and then, you know, you just have great team plays in between those mechanical movements, or do you play as a team from the get-go? And that's kind of what Brawl enables you to do, right? The Ryan Zarya, they're so dependent on each other, they're dependent on the Lucio to speed them in and out of places, you can run it with the Reaper, and, you know, just all those players on your team, they just all consolidate on one location and focus on a target. If you run this Wrecking Ball, even though those angles for the hooks might not be as good, you're just running around in the back line for the most part. Maybe you've got a Tracer or an Echo that catches up with you, helps get down those squishy targets. But for the most part, you're on your alone, so I'm just trying to create as much chaos as possible. And both both different, both different playstyles, they're viable. It just really depends on what your team is practicing and if the players are comfortable playing in more mechanical style. And as we do begin to enter on to King's Row here, you know, I mean, I'm thinking Sienna's probably going to be the more, I think, racy one to try and, you know, play something a little bit more unique. Wanting to something a little more dicey is, is what I would say here. Just again, and, and until we actually get in that, but I just feel at this point they kind of have to because of how Quinnipiac has managed to hold together with their roster and play their you know characters with such proficiency. And I mean, if you want to put them on you know a very you know uncomfortable position, changing up the composition, making it something significantly different. You know, I like the fact that they want to bring in this Ash play as well, which can be very very oppressive, especially when you get the Bob coming up quickly and adding that extra member um but again we'll only see in time but if we take a look at quinnipiac on the defensive side the hanzo and the widowmaker are still a good pick here double snipers do reign supreme maybe not as much as other maps like havana but there's still a lot of great sight lines here we've already seen that they really like to run this hanzo but if you notice they've actually swapped who's playing the hanzo now it's gonna be grub taking their crack at it meanwhile we're gonna see the widow being played by maja so we'll see how that works out Sides have swapped, so this time we're going to see Quinnipiac on the defense first, as you said. Sienna, they are running a bit of a different comp. Uh, you see, they are going to be running... Uh, well, none of that matters because we're going to be uh, resetting that map. So, debated. So, remember when I said earlier where we're trying to set the stage outside of tech issues? hurdles that we go through every day and this is going to be one of them so uh yeah that's not going to be exactly the uh composition that we're looking to see but you know as we as we take a, a hot second for them to get into this game i mean as you were talking about the you know double hit scan and, and the value that it can bring i mean it's still something that's viable but there are you know alternative options especially when it comes to the defensive position that could be a little bit more substantial we've talked a lot about the double shield towards the beginning of the broadcast where we've seen a lot more of the sigma orisa as i have in my background i'm very <laughs> happy to see a lot of that so i mean it's it's going to be interesting to see if they actually want to hold on to that double hit scan even though we said it's a little bit of a, a flub selection going into that map <laughs> 
it can work, but now there's a little bit of a different element, and that's where you kind of already know what the enemy team might be running. So <laughs> do you stick to your game plan or do you swap things up? I think the biggest problem with double sniper composition is, especially with the Widow, she has to play far back. She gets no value trying to take the tanks head on. She's trying to get those flank angles, off angles, anything that can let her click heads. Hanzo, you do have those storm arrows, so you can be a bit of a tank buster. You can help in the front line. But when the Widow's left all on their lonesome, they are very vulnerable, especially with what we saw from... Uh, Sienna out of the get-go they want to run that Junkrat once again so that Junkrat can get in that Widowmaker's face it's going to be a, a very unpleasant day for her and you know you don't say an ag aggressive Junkrat that often but I saw it earlier on today I saw RIT just play with no concern whatsoever they were going to run their Junkrat right into five of the enemy team and if Sienna can play with that same confidence maybe it'll give them a better chance right now they are down by a map but it's just one map they still can get into this series I mean, to piggyback off of it, we saw a stellar amount of Junkrat play when it came to Tespa in the last couple of weeks. There was some overly aggressive Junkrat play, which I would not suggest to anybody, but the fact that it worked to such, you know, perfection towards the end of every round, I was just like, all right, you're basically making your opponent sit in the back line as if you hear either a laughter or the rip tire sound effect. You're just fearing for your life, looking around, hoping that it's not near you. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and when you don't have a Lucio or a Baptiste, which are the best two defensive heroes against that, because the sound barrier, if you time it right, does cancel the tire's damage or nullifies it. Attack Same thing game with game the game Baptiste game. and Mortality Fields, all about timing there, but neither of that's going to exist in uh, Winnipeg. It looks like they don't want to run the Widowmaker anymore. Instead, there is the Bastion coming <laughs> out live and in prime time. Not only live and in prime time, but Lego to boot, which only makes it even better. That's just basically the cherry on top of any dessert. But I'm surprised that they didn't opt to go with the Symmetra to try and get that statue positioning. That's usually something I've seen on the offense. I don't think I've seen as much on the defense, but still a very viable decision instead. They're gonna keep the Bastion on the point. Now it's actually gonna be Sienna running that Widowmaker, so they have a sniper of their own this time around. The Hanzo Widowmaker matchup could be one to look out for, but right now you see Mata just raining in the damage. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, that early pickup gonna come out onto Ace, making sure to force back Sienna and reset with, you know, honestly, nothing to truly contest the Bastion right now. Even if you're peeking and trying to go for a, a shot with the Widowmaker, it's not gonna find much value. And you're seeing Firewolf not even bothering with the shield right now, they're just saying, hey, Bastion, you take care of this, you do enough damage, it's fine. You see swaps coming out once again from Sienna, so they are going back now to the Junkrat and to the Roadhog. They found a little bit of success with this on Legion. They're gonna have more shield damage now with all those grenades, but as you see, Ace already taken so low. Yeah, I mean, in addition to that, you look for the Roadhog to try and get that pick potential onto the Bastion to grab them out of the turret stance, but honestly, with this shield coming out by Firewolf and then also just maintaining with those protective barriers from the Zarya, it's so challenging. You really need this Junkrat to follow through and get those shields gone to try and take down this Bastion. Well, there's going to be a Giants committed early on by Grub. It's not going to find anything, but Planey is going to find one of the set three. They have taken down the Bastion. The Kogi, Kogi has the res, but it looks like this is going back and forth. It might be Sienna's fight to win. Yeah, Grub on the side looking to try and rotate around, getting some damage in the back, but there's far too many numbers by Sienna. And at this point, it's, it's Grub finding some value, but this is a tall task, even for, even for this amazing Hanzo play that we've seen. There is going to be the Bastion. It's going to be the ultimate coming out. Does so much damage, but isn't going to be able to break that shield. Only able to get a Steel Trap in Quinnipiac. It looks like they're going to have to disengage and try again on point two for their defense. Yeah, I'm just more curious if they're going to still opt for this Bastion play or if they're going to look to swap it. I mean, it, it had its value up front, but now in the streets phase, I'm not thinking that they'll want to keep it. But only time will tell as you look for Sienna to push into this choke point. And honestly, this is a very challenging position to push through. Right now, they are able to get the Bastion, so now we'll see if that spawn change will happen. Give a little bit of a gift, honestly, from Sienna. They were caught out a little bit on the Bastion. Maybe they wanted to finally switch things up. Now they got that option, too. There are still six ultimates online for Sienna, and that's one of them coming out, two of them. Oh, Earth Shatter plus the Rip Tire. Transcendence was high hopes, but when you've got explosive damage like that on a direct target, there is no amount of healing over time that's going to keep you alive. And with this dominance up front coming out by Sienna with the Rhine, it's only going to further push that payload. Talking about this earlier, they're Lucio and Batif. They're great counters to that Rip Tire. 
Transcendence just does not save you. Same thing with Diva Bomb or Pulse Bomb. Yes, it does a ton of healing, but it's not going to give you extra shield or protection. So that damage is permanent. The healing is not going to be enough. And a great sleep. And now you're seeing Sienna. They're running their own Bastion. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Sienna's really turned this game around. I mean, we talked about it. They had to try and do something here to exert their dominance. And Earth Shatter does come out to knock down one. There's an immediate follow-up. This is where you've got Quinnipiac regaining their bearings, holding just before the checkpoint, and now they find themselves in a good spot to hold against Sienna and their repeated attempts. Sienna, they do have a lot to work with this fight, though. They got a good amount out from Quinnipiac. They have three ultimates in the bank. That high noon could be their fight winner. The question is, how do you use Valkyrie in this? Do you use it as a damage boost? Do you use it as a way to save your team if they get low? Right now, Sock, they're going to have to think of the hard decisions and how they're going to use their abilities. But honestly, that's what makes a good player. It's those decisions that really can change the ebb and flow of a, a fight and could be the defining factor of a win or a loss in this as we continue to see two minutes and 30 seconds remaining. This slow, methodical play with the Bastion has to be on point because if you find yourself out in the open and there's a Roadhog on the other side, you're going to get shut down instantly. Grab right out is firing away. A really good dynamite for them. Almost has the Bob online, so that could be a great counter. There, the Bastion all the way up top. There's going to be two trades, and right now it's a 5v5. 5v4. Yeah, and you've got this Earth Shatter up front coming through to secure any of the last mate remaining stragglers. Maga manages to get two here. You've even got Flanny on the back looking to get some extra damage. Not too much of a charge, but some decent lob damage there with the back line. So that'll be a nice reset here with two minutes left to go. I was really surprised that they decided to put the Bastion on the high ground of out a shield. Maybe a bit of a misplay from Sienna. Now they're down to two minutes. They had a pretty good attack on that first point, but their time bank is dwindling away bit by bit. They still have four ultimates, almost five to use, but so far they've just not been able to execute. This whole hog needs to be used very quickly. Going to actually get the Earth Shatter first, getting one. That dead eye takes down Ace. No whole hog that fight as you've got bob also going to be focused down by sienna you still have, this is what i was worried about is honestly sienna can really snowball but if they find themselves in a hold position they just cannot break this defense of quinnipiac yeah they keep going for these aggressive plays but the follow-up isn't there it seems like they're a bit discombobulated now they do have a win condition though they still have that nano online i was gonna say a nano bash gets to be very dangerous but these swaps again coming out from cj paul a little bit of musical cheers on that dps roll it's gonna be very hard to build a tire in the meantime they only have a minute left yeah i would have liked to see it more towards that two minute marker but again they wanted to attempt to the best of their ability as they look to continue holding this doorway and this turning point around that bar with a lot of damage still being pumped out by grub uncontested up top with maga as well Ace now looking to try and rotate around the shield, but you've got Flanny looking for the grab. Going to go for that follow-up in the back line. Nobody sees it. That is a no necessary high charge needed because Grub's going to get the executions onto both supports and shut Sienna down. It is for Sienna. They're going to lose this fight, and they're still going to have support also. They're still going to have a little bit of time to contest. It really comes down to if CJ can stay alive on this Junkrat. If they find the Junkrat out, they might not have a contest. The rest of the team, they're pretty slow, and you're seeing... Planning going to take that fight right away. Ace is going to stop over the Diva to try to contest. And oh no, this Junkrat is stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean, I got to give major credit though. This Junkrat is bobbing and weaving. But in the end of it, finds the stick of dynamite. For a, oh, but then the back line, they're going to have a little bit of a contention. But it's just going to be a cheeky play to try and keep this into overtime. You will not be able to see Sienna reach that next checkpoint as Quinnipiac cleans it up. And I got to say, you know, when you're getting a stick of dynamite thrown at the explosion extraordinaire, that's got to feel even worse. Comes down to that Bastion pick. I was really surprised to see in a swap to it. It seems like their composition was working out really well for them on that first point. Then they try to kind of go with their counter Bastion of their own and saw what happens. They just weren't able to get it done. They were stuck right at that second point capture area. And from there, it was all Quinnipiac all the time. And that one tire was so big it was so unfortunate for them they weren't able to find another one because they didn't have another junk rat and again the most challenging part of that point is there's so many different avenues that you can play you had flanny rotate around the backside nobody had vision on it free grab in the backside you still continue to maintain those high grounds where the two windows are maga continuing to maintain that mccree up into the open streets portion where the bookstore is with the crossfire as well coming out from grub on the ash like there's just so much you have to work with since sienna just could never manage to gain enough information to really turn the tides 
You saw Ace try to flank a few times on the Roadhog, but just wasn't willing to engage. Didn't want to int too hard and be found out, Roadhog. Does have a lot of self-sustain, but a whole team like focusing you down, that's not going to be enough to keep you alive. Meanwhile, for Quinnipiac, they have just been running the flanks all day, all night. You saw it from Planny there with the Graviton Surge. You've seen it from Grub a few times on the McCree. They're very confident on the side of Quinnipiac. They're willing to make those risky plays, and so far, the risk has been worth the reward. I love that subtle Venom Mine right at the peak of the wall. Totally, totally not accidental. <laughs> As you've got some shots still gonna come through. CJ playing a very, very risky game when you're looking to go against that Hanzo play that we've seen earlier, but still looks to gain some value as long as the reposition is very favorable. But oh my goodness, Quinnipiac coming in big and Grub finding a double with Maga as well, just constantly shutting down CN. That's it, fight's over, that's, that's control point taken. You saw there early on that CJ was forced out of that high ground positioning because of the Hanzo shot, immediately fell low, and oh that's a 5v6. But in fact, they're going to take those all day, every day, and a charge. What is going on? They, right now, you're seeing the Quinnipiac, they are only one person on the points. This actually might be recontestable from Sienna. I mean, it might be, but the fact that you've got Grub literally chilling in the back, gaining free value, is, is unbelievable. And this is what we were talking about, kind of that support line, and I was really curious to see how individuals are going to play it. You don't really have the crowd control to take down this type of tracer play, and if you have nothing to respond to it, it's free farming. It's free real estate, and right now, business is a booming for this Hanzo. Two fadeaway shots to boot. How can you stop this damage from coming in? It's just an ash on their loans. And if you're Quinnipiac, you've built up the dragon already. We've seen time and time again, they don't want to wait for the Graviton oh. Surge. I, I can't even talk because just the kills, they just keep coming. I mean, this is extremely dominant. And one of the biggest things for right now for Sienna is just to allow themselves to gain six and just be very aware of this high ground because this Hanzo and Tracer play is carrying right now. There's gonna be a pole swarm it is gonna find one and even though the dragons weren't able to find a kill, it's a good zoning ult. You see, they're fighting all the way on point three. That car is still trying to get to the golden box of victory I mean, before point two. And this is, this is over. Broccoli just got a tweet from the payload. Yeah, literally Broccoli just sitting in the pot, getting some steamed, getting some fresh greens out of the pot. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Literally not a care in the world with how well aggressed Quinnipiac is playing. I mean, that was a very, very convincing game. I mean, to, to be fair though, Sienna had a very aggressive gameplay as well, but they just could not match this type of frontline damage with these two DPS. And that's a focal point. Sienna has to figure out a way to take down this DPS lineup from Quinnipiac. Headshots on headshots coming out from the Hanzo. And sometimes it's just, you can't compete with that kind of skill. You got to figure out some way to deal with it. And sitting out in the open with those sidelines, that's not the way to do it. Currently, Quinnipiac, they are up 2-0. But we're going to take a short break before map three. It's going to be Temple of Anubis when we come back in just a little bit.
Hello and welcome back, friends. The break was quick because we want to continue to bring this action to you live. As we've seen, Quinnipiac managed to gain two maps very convincingly over Sienna. And at this point, Sienna's going to have to bolster their morale and try and obtain a reverse sweep because we find ourselves, Jag, on a match point. Absolutely. It's 2-0 for Quinnipiac. They win one more and it is game over, Sienna. They got to win this one or draw it. It is a salt, so it is possible for a draw to continue this series onward. And we were talking about this during that short break. Sienna on attack. They looked all right. They looked pretty good at some parts, but then touch up their comp. They aren't able to get their footing. They stall out, especially when it comes to being stuck, you know, with, without the cart. They're just kind of trying to get onto the point and they aren't able to do that. Pretty pack. They're just taking advantage of that kind of misplay from Sienna and they are rolling with it. That was a very dominant attack from them. That first point gone in 30 seconds. When they capped the second point, they pushed all the way into the defender's spawn on third point. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Sienna is definitely, I mean, I could honestly say Quinnipiac is as well, a very momentum-based team, is once they start to get the snowball, that they can take advantage. But the biggest problem is, is that if they find themselves on the short end of an engagement, they're unable to truly recover, where we've seen Quinnipiac, even when they're cut down a couple at the start, they can still either draw out a fight to find a more favorable opportunity, or be able to take value, even with their delay and stagger in a lost fight. Absolutely. It looks like when Quinnipiac, they lose things. They just, they, they wait. They're patient. Mm -hmm. They regroup. They go for the full re-engage, and it works out in their favor more times than not. Meanwhile, Sienna, when they get into those weird kind of in-between fights, they seem a little bit lost, and that might come down to communications or no fight planning. All those things are very important in team-based Overwatch. As opposed to ladder, it's a little bit just more like, hey, I'm going to run in and hope I don't die. Speaking of not running in and dying, going to see what happens on this first point of temple of the newest the size has swapped once again so this time we're going to see sienna on the defense going to be on the attack i mean to be honest the fact that sienna has been a little bit more predominantly on the junk route i feel is going to favor them in this there's a lot of really narrow corridors that you can work through damage through the doorway but also, this is one of those maps where uniquely enough, we actually see a lot of echo play. We have not yet seen it from either of these teams, but regardless if it's an echo or it's an ash or even, you know, in this case, which I would not be surprised to see Quinnipiac again on a Hanzo, there's just a great ability to gain crossfire and just find different angles on the smaller pedestals that give you elevation to really catch individuals off guard. So with Sienna, you just have to make sure that they do not find themselves in an unfavorable position as they have like so on King's Row being flanked or getting grabbed from behind or anything of those natures here. You just need to be very aware that there is probably going to be multitude of places that this team of Quinnipiac is going to be. How do you stop a fast engage coming from the choke? Well, there's <laughs> one way. It's a junk rat and they've been running the junk rat the entire time and I was going to say, I'd be very surprised if they weren't, but they are, so we don't have to worry about that. If you position yourself well enough, if you're able to get that damage boost from the Mercy, from Vigar in this scenario, you can do a lot of damage before the enemy team can even get in there. I'm not sure if Quinnipiac will have the shields to counter it. I wouldn't be surprised if they try running a double shield, especially with Firewolf on the Orisa early on. I don't think they're going to run an Orisa Wrecking Ball, but I have seen weirder things in the past. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of weird things in the past, I mean, to be honest. So going into this, I mean, this is just something of a genuine, you know, compassionate understanding of selection. I don't know where I'm going with that. But as we take a look, like you said, the Junkrat's going to be here. And honestly, the May is an interesting one. I like the fact that you're going to have it for dividing and conquering the team. But with the type of damage in front line, I'm not sure how valuable that's going to be. Zarya all the way back on the second high ground top. That's very interesting. You're going to end up dropping, and you see that. In fact, they swap completely to that dive composition, so they're going to run in with their Winston now, try to control that high ground that Deeb's going to be there to DM them. Oh, nice dive coming through, but Cookie finding themselves very out in the open. She is not able to withstand that incoming damage, but you've got this hit scan play coming from Quinnipiac up top, uncontested, managing to take down that Mercy as well. Another, oh my goodness, stop it! You are already showing us that you can play a Hanzo, and now you're absolutely obliterating with a quad, and one of those being a Venom Mine on a Widow, we're done, friend. It doesn't matter if it's his skin or Projectile. This Sniper is getting it done for Quinnipiac. That's going to be a very fast cap. Only 
a little bit under a minute by one or two you know seconds. One, they have the Infrasight. They're going to use it immediately. And that's an enable Grub to look for a Pulse Bomb. Oh, that Zen sitting pretty in the back. You looking for a Crumpet and wants it now, but doesn't find it. The Baker is not in the kitchen as you've got now this rotation back looking to try and hold off. Pulse Bomb gets two, draws the attention back, and now leaves multiple vulnerable up front. But there is a shield, at least from the Sigma, managing to prevent those sight lines in the back, especially with Cookie Nut getting the res onto that Winston play. This should be Quinnipiac's position to take advantage of this defensive side, despite the respawn advantage. Maga up front, you've got Broccoli just procking a transcendence just for security and as an insurance policy as the remaining members of. Sienna get obliterated on the point. There could be a full six recontest here, but I am telling you, Sienna is not going to be able to do too much more here. There is the male being thrown out. The Blizzard not going to be eaten by the Diva D defense matrix. So they are able to freeze up the tank line, but no kills came out of it. And now you're seeing the Primal Rage coming out on the other side from Firewolf. Oh, you need executions on the individuals like Ace. So low, under 25% health, does not get taken down. You also have this Tracer, super vulnerable with the Discord orb, but just consistent assistance from the back line. And actually, because you've got the Mercy out of this fight, there's a real opportunity of switching this back. You know what? I gotta say, Sienna, despite having a real problem right now, they could manage to hold on to this because, well, as I say that, then it goes instantly away. Um, so that's going to be a cleanup here by Quinnipiac. And uh, literally just uh, this Widow left with their own devices. <laughs> Well, they're able to kill off 40 seconds, maybe a minute more. They are still getting the fix, but now the Mercy has come back into the fray. You saw the res come out on to Rub, but taken down once again. So all they have is that Zenyatta healing. This is going so back and forth, but it looks like Sienna, they will stabilize at the end of this and taking out Grub. Oh. That is going to be the nail in the coffin. So 94.1% for Quinnipiac, but still not able to get that final bit of point percentage to cap. I mean, to be honest, a lot of that also came down to the positioning of the defensive side from Sienna because you noticed at the end there, the Widow sightline was nothing. There was no ability to get anything because of that Sigma shield and the pillars from the architecture. But now you've got Firewolf going back into this primal race to tuck the supports into the back, trying to get a juggle, but oh, beautiful wall to buy time as well. But it's still just not going to be enough here. You've got a lot of oppression coming through from that front line. You do have at least Nourishment attempting to get that Blizzard up and used once again if there is numbers advantage by Quinnipiac. And honestly, this is just a really, really back and forth skirmish between these two. Absolutely. You see that the mail still online. You're gonna see Sock actually commit the sound barrier, but it's not gonna save Vigar, and that's a huge play for Quinnipiac. Now the Blizzard gonna come up with the transcendence online on the other side, so that's gonna be able to keep the team alive. Double supports going to activate their ult from Quinnipiac. We've got the transcendence and the Valkyrie gonna be forced out here, though you didn't have the Valkyrie more so for damage boost, it was just assisted healings. I would have liked to see that be a little bit more de aggressive nature to try and eliminate these few individuals because Sienna. At this point, I gotta give them credit for running the clock as long as they have. And they're still running it. It's not over just yet. Vygar has that Valkyrie online. Is gonna pop it immediately. If they can stall out long enough to let CJ get back into this fight, they might be able to hit a really big shatter, but it just looks like that Reinhardt's not gonna make it in time. Nope. Finally going to reach its end. Round one completes. But instead of it being almost a five-minute time bank, that's been brought down to two minutes and 24 seconds. So... I mean, good on Sienna, at least for their defensive hold, but now I'm really curious to see what it's going to look like for a game on the swap of sides. Yeah, Quinnipiac maybe playing a bit sloppier there than we're used to. We saw a bit on King's Row as well, where maybe they got a bit ahead of themselves. They said, hey, this is over. Let's just have fun of it. But it's never over in Overwatch, especially not on Assault. That defender spawn is so close. You can just stall that point for forever and ever and half of that time bank was demolished in the end by sienna still a good cap 224 for quinnipiac so could see extra rounds if sienna could steps up their game so far yeah despite having a good defensive hold we've seen them struggle on attack as well i mean just looking at the lineup now for quinnipiac on this defense i would just be scared <laughs> like just with this Hanzo and this Widowmaker and that doorway and the archway overhead, if you just peek, you truly need some kind of defensive shielding that is going to last and try and just press through this to reach that middle high ground to shut down Quinnipiac. Because if you don't, that's just going to be once again free farming for this Hanzo and Widow. 
I find it so interesting that you see that the DPS for Quinnipiac, they keep swapping back and forth between who plays his skin and projectile. They're just that versatile, they're just that dangerous. I feel confident on either role. You're gonna see again, Sienna, they're gonna come out we have a double shield. This is going to be the Winston Reinhardt. We saw this earlier on Leech on, but this time they're going to try to use that symmetry just to cut all the way through that choke point and just go directly to the point. I don't dislike this, but this is going to require a high level of coordination. And when you've got an Ana from Broccoli tossing a Bionade to secure two are going to be instantly removed from this fight, that is not going to work in your favor. And that might be an instance <laughs> where we see the... Okay, Grub. Okay! We see the Ananade being really effective, and if, you know, the rest of the team is full field, then you can get those anties easily. Now, we're gonna see Sienna. They're gonna swap things up just a little bit. No more of the Symmetra. So they're not gonna try to cut through that choke point again, and you're seeing... Because the snipers right now are going back, they are doing so much damage immediately at the beginning. Maka having to flee, managing to get topped off. Maintaining this middle high ground, and again, this is the challenge. Your team is a little bit separated by Sienna. A sleep dart comes out as well on the tracer. Oh, goodness. I will say, you you fell a little short getting the tracer, and now the cat and mouse game begins as Maga looks to try and get this takedown onto the tracer, looking for the lead into that potential dash, but all the while, an earth shatter comes out in the small corridor down the stairway where Firewolf is just setting a blaze to the enemy. And I want to point out that it was in the end the Hanzo that won that matchup, so... <laughs> that's a team wipe right now. Everyone gone on the side of Sienna. A minute oh, and a half gone in. Oh, stop it! They've got families at home! Oh, just leave them be. That's okay. You know, as we've got now 2 minutes and 20 seconds, the D.Va coming out... I mean, I gotta at least give Sienna some some points for resilience right now. They're trying everything that they can to adapt to this, where it's just been so stellar for this DPS lineup, even going on to these adaptations. They need to try and find something that sticks. There's gonna be an early Dragons in. You might see the Hanzo stuck out a little bit, but the projected bubble gonna be there to save the DPS character. You're seeing that the entire teams around the Hanzo took five people finally to bring them down, and the rotation right now, Sienna trying their best to take someone out. The bubble gonna save the Reinhardt on the charge, and there's the res canceling out that first kill. Yep, just gonna look for a reset now. The straggler is going to be very easily taken down, and another double bio nade to secure. There's no more value. Coalescence and Valkyrie committed to this by Sienna. I am really, really not liking. Just personally feel like that could have been held for the final fight segment of this after this fight and cleaning it up. But you know, I mean, again, we've got at least potentially a self destruct, the pulse bomb, and an earth shatter to come into this last one. They committed the high noon there, and that's an ultimate they really would have liked to hold for something else. They were so confident in that fight, they committed three ultimates and. Even though they had gotten some picks no in that fight, just weren't able to get the job done. Sense. That's sometimes the difference between a good and a great team is a great team can win even when the advantage isn't in their favor. This duel between the Widow and Tracer is nutty as well right now. I'm really looking to see if that shot's going to come through. But Grob finally gets it with nothing but perseverance and grit manages to take down that elusive Tracer in the back. Maga going to try and clean up that the Kree on the front line looking to also pick off the supports. But honestly, when you've got a pocket healer, it doesn't matter. Cookie's just saying, all right, my friend, I'm just going to stick right here with you. Uh, in League, it's kind of like the Yumi effect, right? Just have the Mercy stick on the carry and let them do the work. But still, Cookie doing a great job in there, right? And is going to be chased down, almost falls, but is able to get out with some great duo support play. And now Broccoli having to use that nade to save themselves. Broccoli just, oh my goodness, the focus fire. They want the grandma and still can't manage to get it. The charge comes through onto the DPS line. The seconds dwindle as you have Quinnipiac managing to claim victory on Temple of Anubis and securing a 3-0 victory in this series. Pretty dominant one at that, especially on Kings Row. I was very impressed with their attack there. They did give up a little bit of ground on the defense, but it's not about how much ground you give up. It's about how you finish the map out and I mean, they were able to hold it at the very end here. Even though they were down in a few fights, still able to regroup that team synergy. Very potent for Quinnipiac. And as you said, a 3-0 victory. Sienna now going to fall down once again on the season. And, you know, you got to think. It's looking rough here in the fall split, but they still have plenty of time to regroup. They got one more game in Week 8 that could really help them.
you know, power them up as we go into the spring split later on in 2021. You just got to build up some momentum somewhere. Indeed. I mean, I can honestly say that Quinnipiac managed to definitely uh, accelerate with some momentum here and really has been showing that they are a force to be reckoned with. And, you know, speaking of forces to be reckoned with, we've got another set of, well, we've got another matchup coming here just shortly after. But before we get that next one underway, we'll be heading to a brief break before getting this one underway for the final match of the night, my friends. So don't go anywhere. Hello and welcome back, friends. Like we said, we'll be back in just a moment, but it's not going to be with our final match of the day. It's actually going to be with an interview first from the amazing Cookie, who was just from Quinnipiac. Again, Cookie, it is a pleasure to have you here. We are so thankful for you to give us a few minutes of your time, but I got to start this off. Before we got into this right now, we just found out a piece of information that there is some interesting dynamics of a relationship that you have with someone on the opposing team that you just were able to take a 3-0 over. Yeah, um, funny enough, um, on the Sienna team, um, Pooh Sock, actually, um, is my older sister from Sienna College. I mean, that's that's such an interesting dynamic, and I guarantee you there is some bad blood going into this where your sister's literally just probably, like, texting you or messaging you and DMing you right now and be just like, why you do that to me, friend? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> 100%. Um, we're both laughing about it, but um, we've been waiting for this. This is the first time we've ever been on the esports team, the both of us. So we've mm -hmm. been waiting for this moment for us to match. And honestly, this was like my favorite match ever. It was so fun to play against her and her team. I mean, it's it's it is exciting to see, and I I honestly have to say, so so like, are you both just like, are like you just you have support in your nature? Like <laughs> you're, you're also yeah. fulfilling that same role too. Yeah, we both love playing support, and we're both Mercy mains, which is really, really fun. Um, so being able to verse her was really funny. That's I gotta, awesome. I gotta ask then, who pockets who if you play comp together? Ooh. Oh, Ooh. um, sometimes when we play comp together, um, I'll let her be the Mercy, and I'll be somebody else. Um, when we play together, or sometimes we won't play support; we'll play something else for fun. <laughs> 
I love how you said, I'll let her play Mercy. (laughs) I'll let her. I'll just let her. (laughs) So I got to ask, you talked about having fun, and it looks like you guys were having a lot of fun. You were doing some different and unique things. I got to ask, we had that, uh, you know, we had that kind of reset where we had to restart King's Row because the settings in game weren't correct. And you guys originally came up with double shields. And then you said, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to run a bastion on the ground. I got to ask, just what, what was the thought process behind that on the team? That was all from our teammate, um, <laughs> Maga. He is um, quite the character. And he just thought it was, would be a good idea to start off King's Row defending with a bastion. So we all just kind of went along with it. I tried to pocket him as much as I could being Mercy. Of course, that didn't really work out in our favor because we did lose the points. So we did have to switch off. But, you know, sometimes we'll just do things like kind of spontaneous like that. So um, just worth a shot. <laughs> it was kind of it was all his idea, um, you know, but it was fun. Yeah, well, you know, what's more fun than a Bastion on King's Row getting that 3-0 victory. So congratulations once again, Cookie, and to the rest of Quinnipiac. A great job. Well done, and that's going to be it for this interview. Thank you for joining us, and Richard, take us out to the break. Yes, indeed, my friends. We'll be back in just a moment. It's been an awesome opportunity to have this chance to speak with this individual, and we will be back in just a moment, my friends.
Hello and welcome back, friends. We are here at the very tail end of this evening, where we find the last match between Fairfield University and Ryder University going head-to-head -to, -head to see who is going to claim victory. I am Rich Rad here with Jag as we continue on, and I'm excited to finish this last match off of the night. You've got some interesting details, too, about this team, but before we get into that, I do have to comment. For those that have been watching on the break, uh, if you've noticed that there is a very right-sided heavy victory, we saw RIT take the first one on the right side of the score. We've got St. Peter's on the right side also taking it. We just saw Quinnipiac. So, I mean, we're looking at Ryder, but there's some interesting history there, though, isn't there, Jag? Yeah, absolutely. Ryder is coming into this 4-1. Meanwhile, Fairfield at 2-4. and four. So, Ryder definitely has that win-loss advantage going to this, but they haven't played in about two weeks now for EGF. They had a bye two weeks ago. Last week, they won via forfeit. So the question is, even though they are the favorite, how will they play after having so much time off? They could be a bit rusty, and that rust can be so disadvantaged, or be a disadvantage for them. That's what I was trying to say. Words, you know, English. It's okay. Literally, <laughs> I, I we all find ourselves there. I can't say words a lot of the times in my life. Uh... <laughs> But yes, you're very correct with Ryder being, you know, away from a competitive scene in EGF. It's really going to rely on their due diligence to be able to scrim and practice outside of this type of environment so that they're not partially shaky or feeling a little bit uncomfortable. And when you go into moments like this, you really just need to come in with a clean head just to say, all right, we're going to be just like, let's think about this. We got a clear state of mind. We coming back into this. How are we going to fend off against Fairfield? And we need to just keep our momentum that we've had before this and go into this feeling very confident. Yeah, Ryder, one of the top five teams in EGF during this fall. So let's see if they can keep that steady rise of prominence going in. It's going to be the exact same map that we've seen all night to open things off. It's going to be the map you know you love. It's control. It is Lee Jong Tower. And both these teams rocking that very lovely red. This time, it's going to be started off on Gardens. Gardens, a map known very well for its dive compositions. But instead, it looks like out of the gate, we might be seeing some brawl here. Yeah, I'd be really curious, especially now we're starting on this map. It's going to be Night Market first versus City Center, which we saw a little bit earlier. Having more of that close in proximity positioning, you don't have a high sky box. There's a lot of restrictions when it comes to some of the positional advantage. But with here, you know, with that type of, yes, with the brawl, it's more so going to be what who is more so going to get to that point first and take advantage of it outright? Because I think that is always such a big factor when you come to a map like this. It looks like from Fairfield, they were rocking that Symmetra early on. And we know that teleporter, it loves to cut out distance. And you can use it right in the window above the little uh, body of water you can fall into. So they can just use that teleporter, get straight on to the point, set up sim turrets, and try to control it right there. That's a composition you usually see of the double shield as there's a lot more sustain, a lot more protection. But instead, they're going to do it with a brawl composition so far. It looks like they want to run that Ryan Zarya. So... A little bit different, but it can still work out in their favor if they play that early advantage, that early point cap. And again, one of the biggest things, too, to kind of keep an eye out for is one of the big MVPs that we saw was a lot of Hanzo play on this map. But, you know, entering in with the composition that we were looking to see, you know, I mean, it's it's going to be a lot of focus on, I think, the DPS lineup between these two, because with a lot of point presence from the tanks and the support lines that we've seen, it's really relied on the re the revolving DPS, you know, exterior where they're trying to find an angle to get that advantage to, you know, try and lead into a more favorable control point. But again, it looks like we're actually going to be heading on to a break. It looks like for the moment here, just as we're waiting, there's a little bit more of a technical difficulty at the present time. So don't go anywhere, friends. We'll be actually, I think they're ready. You know, I love how that happens. That's OK. We're actually going on break. So they weren't ready. So this is us literally at this point just saying, you know what, friends, we're going to give you some time to go get some drink and food because we're going to want you to be prepped and ready once we get this first match underway.
Hi, and welcome back, friends. We are now entering into this map of Li Zhang Tower. Actually, going to enter into the map of Li Zhang Tower. No pauses, technical difficulties, or any sort of roadblocks, at least for the time being. As we see these two go head to head, and that Symmetra, as you called it, is going to allow Fairfield to get onto this point quickly. Looks like they're expecting Ryder to come over the bridge and said they're going to go through that white room. And one of the most interesting things you see as Green Aspects is going to find out Ranger and. This fight gonna be wrapped up pretty quickly as Riggs, known for that hit scan on Ryder, is actually on the off tank roll, so swapping things up on the side of Ryder. And so far, very early on, uh, it's not working out for them, but it's only been one fight, so maybe they'll be able to turn around after a few more. Yeah, you made that comment when we were on the break, since we got a little bit of a back-end information to know that that DPS swapped to an alternative role, and I'm really curious to see how that's gonna fend off here for, you know, Ryder, with Fairfield at least taking this point early and getting some percent. And maybe on the other side, WLK, this is a really proficient Hanzo player. They are playing Hanzo when it wasn't exactly the best pick to be making a few weeks ago when this split started. Now, Hanzo definitely a lot more viable, especially when you're running a Zarya of your own. Try to combo with Wrench's Graviton Surge. We got now already a high charge coming in from Riggs in the backside, as we said, swapping from that DPS roll. But honestly, nobody from Ryder is managing to ride the Stallion onto that point quick enough to get any kind of advantage. And that's going to be a good 33% continuing to climb. Fairfield feeling happy and comfortable. Right now, they just got onto that point, and they just have not let it go at all. That Sim TP coming out early, let them hold it, and Ryder, they've made some swaps. They swapped on to that Korean dive composition with Zarya Winston, and you saw Ranger just kind of jump in and immediately get focused down by the rest of Fairfield. And Fairfield, they use some ultimates on that defense, but they still have a good amount to use. As we see the photon barrier coming online, going to be used when the grab comes through. Beautiful timing to synergize well to block a lot of the incoming damage, especially with the high charge. But speaking of high charge and damage output, great aspect is coming out with a big, big win right now for the team. Those turrets, the teleporter, and just the amount of energy being forced out in tandem with wrench is disgusting right now. And one thing that we want to point out is that a wrench is legit. That's something that our producer told us. <laughs> this, and th you see it so far. The Zarya Church has been incredible. They've been able to use their bubbles at perfect times. And now that Grab Dragons is online. Ryder does have the sound barrier, but it might not be enough to save them. Oh, High Noon getting two and two critical picks. Both the Ryan and the Symmetra out of the fight. The Dragon Strike comes through, but a little bit of loss of coordination between the two. The Dragon Strike comes out late so it doesn't get as much value into the clustered members of Ryder. And with the numbers advantage, Ryder's going to be able to bring this through into the overtime, switching it back into their favor, but they've still got a tall mountain to climb. There might have been a disconnect there between WLK and Wrench. Maybe Wrench is saying, hey, this is still winnable. WLK's like, no, 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 let's save it for later. The grab coming early, the dragon's coming late. One way or another, Fairfield is going to lose that point. Now Ryder in control. They still have... That coalescence online, they could use that is a very smart way to engage a lot of healing, a lot of damage done with that Moira ult. Now, as you see, you've got Phoenix at least with the Rip Tire, and this is really important to make sure that these ultimates are staggered out for the ones that are coming online. Riggs getting very low, but this Roadhog with a Taker Breather and the flank coming around the back. Bolt support is gone. Ryder's going to be able to take this very quickly. And Fairfield now, again, finding themselves needing to be very stable going into these future fights. So that mask couldn't get that sound barrier online in time. The team didn't know where that tire was coming from. A great play by the Junkrat on the side of Ryder. Now, they've been able to hold this point for a little bit. They've been able to build up two ultimates, almost three with Softy trying to get that high noon. They're going to go again for the teleport onto the point. Oh, the Urge Shatter could come through, but with this whole hog going to make that Ryan Hart go sky high is for sure not allowing any sort of follow through. Honestly, Ryder is playing this very, very well. They're prepared for that teleport. You saw the whole hog right under where they teleport out. Can't shatter if you don't touch the ground in there. Adric making a good play to not try to hit Q during that. Even though Riders build up some ultimates, you're seeing Fairfield. They've been a bit patient now. They do have four online. W okay, looking for another dragon. The question is, do they use it without the Graviton Surge? Oh, the hook comes through with the block from the Winston up front. 
you did not see that follow through and honestly that's going to leave very favorable into Ryder's hands. Support ultimate's going to be forced out. The Dragon Strike comes in though from the back line of Fairfield to attempt to take down a few. Another pickup comes in by Riggs. You know, we talked about Riggs playing more so of this tank line changing over from the DPS lineup, but there is still a lot of damage to be had by them and also some very clutch hooks. And even Absolutely. right there, there is one more for the books as well. Just a bit of a yoink right there. And you nailed it right on the head. You see that they swapped off of the Zarya onto the Roadhog and just did so, so well. Uh, uh, we're we're globe trotting right now. We're going around the world as we enter into uh, into a replay of last map, but that's okay. We're just giving you a highlight for those that came later for this match specifically of what we were anticipating um, to come through. So uh, yeah, you know what that happens, friends. We just I mean, like it, to give you flashbacks. It's a great, really great performance, yeah, from Quinnipiac. So, uh, but, that, but as here's we return, the way from this matchup. <laughs> <laughs> as we return, Jag. Well, this is a great play by Fairfield. They gave them such a great start on Lee Jung. Uh, gardens, but now they're going to be moving on to a different point, and it is control center. So brawl on brawl on brawl for this one. See Ryder, they're going to be running a Genji this time around, and no Ana. So that's very interesting. No Nano Blade online for them. I'm putting a lot of pressure right now on this Genji play because I have seen so much of it just fall to the wayside, but. If these dash resets and consistent shuriken damage come through, I'm going to be real happy looking to evade. But unfortunately, when you've got wrench with a beam, there is no way you're deflecting that charge of plasma. Yeah, even though there were some good dashes, Fairfield, they took that fight early and they won it early on getting two early picks there from the get-go. Now, they're losing positional advantage a bit. Instead of trying to play the choke, they've been pushed back all the way to the point. And now, right, they're going to re-engage with a lot of steam. Team needs to be hot enough to enter onto this point to remove the opponent who has managed to get a decent amount of percent to start to this. Has almost a takedown onto Ranger. Does get the follow through. The coalescence in the back by Zodiac as well will manage to be able to keep this team alive, at least for the time being. But Soggy comes in with a double, follows through with a triple, a quad, a whole six stack. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That just has to be one of the most unlucky plays ever. You're like, oh, the dragon's not going to kill me as I try to get out. And there's going to be a bit of a quicker trip back to the spawn. And talk about how quickly Soggy built up that dragon. But Riggs built up that Graviton Surge like no other. Does not matter what role they are on. They are still dominating. And now you're going to see Nifty Bean commit that cool just to help keep the tanks alive as they try to hold up this choke. That Dragon Strike was the quicker, cleaner upper for all of those at home wondering exactly what we want to call that, as there is still some dominance up front. Another takedown comes through with the Storm Arrow. Grab going to be forced out for Fairfield, attempting to get a combination of their own. Dragon Strike finds Zilch with a beautiful sound barrier placed on the back side from Ryan on the side of Riders and manages to hold strong. Riggs again gonna have this Graviton Surge, but even though they don't have the Nano online to pocket their Genji, they could just try to combo it with the Blade right here. Keep everyone in one place, just slash and dash your way to victory. Right, if they come through, the Blade should be comboed, but so- Oh, Soggy's coming in, and you've even got that Genji playing here. It says, Shimada brother, I'm also included in this. You may have a bow, but I've at least got a dagger. Yeah, there you see that the dragon is probably the better play. It's an instant death blow to the team that's caught in it. And now, Fairfield, they have to try to rotate all the way around. They can't keep going through that choke that they've tried to over and over. But now this narrow position, you do find the dragon blade able and ready. But the stun comes through from Ranger's Earth Shatter up front. Riggs also trying to assist in that follow through as well to maybe turn this back. But honestly, there is just far too much of the advantage of riders. They are definitely riding home into the sunset as you've got 10% left to go and only stragglers remain for Fairfield. Nas has to get out of this alive and there's going to be a charge on to oh. Adric. So there goes your main tank. It's looking impossible. It is impossible for Fairfield to get back. And that is Ryder going to come in and take the 2-0 here on Lee Jong. And I gotta say, compared to some of the earlier matches, this was pretty competitive, pretty back and forth. You saw, though, the difference between the Graviton Surge and the Dragon combination between the two teams. It worked out so much better for Ryder. I mean, even with, like, even with the couple of picks that happened before the grab, that was just still a stellar stack right now. I mean, just 
I'm going to I'm going to be honest. I have not seen Hanzo in a while and it is so exciting to see it played the way that it has been tonight. Hey, there's a lot of different ways you can play. You can play it more aggressive in the front line. You can play it a little bit farther back looking for those off angle picks. Either way, it seems to be working. These teams have found a way to make Hanzo be very valuable. And here you see, again, Hanzo, different team, same result. Heads clicked, dragons thrown, bodies on the ground. Bodies on the floor is right. And now as we go into this next one, we got to try and take a, a step back. Well, let's, let's look at Fairfield. So Fairfield, they managed to find a couple of nice engagements, which led them into an early advantage. But they were always consistently caught out by the DPS, which, again, we're seeing a very consistent trend here for these types of teams that are doing very well, as we saw earlier with Knipiak. Both of the DPS line really accelerating through this, managing to find value. The biggest thing is, is how Fairfield is going to be able to compete against this. And what do you think we could see going into this next one that might be able to favor them pressing into this next one? I don't think it's the composition that's the problem. I, I think that the problem is that the coordination just isn't there for them. WLK does love to play this Han, so I'd be so I'd be surprised if they swap off of that. And they're pretty good at it too. Obviously, on the other side, Ryder got a little bit of the better matchup there, but that comes in with the synergy and the coordination that we saw from Ryder as a whole. Fairfield, they had what they needed to win. They just weren't able to properly use it. You saw before that they used the grab when they were already down to the dragons came in late and that was on the first point of Lee Jong and that kind of continued on control center they were able to win that first fight on the point but what happened after that they overextended themselves they gave up position they played way too far back and from there Ryder was able just to go in and that train it did keep on chugging and they were able to roll through the rest of the map but we're going to be taking a trip now to the UK to London once again it is going to be King Row, King's Row for our second map and, we, you know, King's Row, we've seen some interesting selections. We commented lightly at the top of the broadcast, at least for the second half, about Bastions and Junkrats and Ashes. And we've actually managed to see two of those three to start, with the Bastion being a very interesting one, as we had from our previous interview, Cookie, uh, who we were gracious enough to have some of their time. But, you know, again, with the plays that we were seeing, Another thing also to kind of take a chapter from our previous matches is if you are going to adapt to something different as you go through this matchup is to also be very cognizant of when you're making these switches. And you did make the comment where, you know, Fairfield doesn't really need to, at this present time, adapt in a compositional sense and more so be able to adapt in a coordination sense. So going into this, that's the one thing I'm going to really, really try to focus on to see if Fairfield manages to change this up and with their composition having great aspect, at least coming out on this Junkrat and synergizing with WLK on this Hanzo, I'm really curious how they're going to be able to prevail against Ryder, who has been doing very well. And Sagi coming out on this Widow could be very scary. I want to point out that there were more stops coming out from Ryder. This is a team that likes to really rotate their entire roster, especially in that tank line. We've seen it time and time again. One tank line comes in for one map, then they rotate to the next one. But look at Riggs. Riggs is now on the Baptiste, so... Rix is just a Swiss army knife of the EGF, has been able to play every role now that I've seen in an official matchup. They're gonna be on that Baptiste, and Bap can do a lot, not, not, not just healing, but a lot of damage if you're able to hit your shots. Sometimes played as a heal bot, sometimes played as an all-you-can-do-it kind of character. Now let's see if they're able to get some value with it with their swaps. And you commented even earlier before we started the broadcast together, the recent patch allowing Van Amplification Matrix to turn in from a window to a garage door. will also be interesting to see how that's going to be utilized into this map. Three minutes and 30 seconds as you've got this transition across the high ground. A charge making sure that there is not too much damage taken. With this on a position, also need to be very careful not to get picked off by either WLK or Aspect. But the fact that Soggy's coming in with this Genji and getting a takedown onto Zodiac killer is really critical you don't usually see genji nowadays but just the follow-up has been great the dash is coming in at the right moment onto the weak targets and there is that garage door that ant mage is coming out early on and you might be thinking why would you use an ult so early in a fight that you've already won you build this ultimate so quickly that it's okay but don't forget Ryder, you still have a point to cap even if you've won the fight and you've got that hard char high charge as well from the Zarya to lead into this. And again, entering into the payload phase, I'm wanting to see the adaptation, which is going to be a 76 and a Reaper play coming out from Fairfield to respond to it. They're going to try to play more aggro. They're going to try to play in Ryder's face. They want to force them in a position they don't want to be in, especially with this tank buster. But you see, WLK, instead of playing the front line, tried to play on the flank, and it did not work out. 
No, not at all. There's a sound barrier, though, for Retaliation by Fairfield attempting to push back Ryder into this choke point, that archway, which can be extremely challenging to push to try and wear the clock. Because again, mind you, this is just under five minutes with a Dragon Blade now to enter. Goes for one in the back, looks for the double onto the support line. A sleeping and beautiful Bionade follow-up coming in by Ranger to make that blade and Genji get some worthwhile credit, which we have not seen in some time. Speaking of Ana, remember, her nade change went live now, so she can throw her nade through an entire healthy uh, allies and then hit that nade through them. So there's a little bit of an element of, is that nade coming to get us? Right now, you're seeing that Rider, they are able to build up that grab dragon, and that beat was already committed by Mass. Typical position to be in. Grab's going to come through. You Oh, and a bio nade again. Those are just devastating and right now Ryder is in a full gallop at this point with the payload yeah those Broncos are bucking right now they're gonna get mass at the end of that and for for Hanzo are on the side of Ryder had a perfectly set up grab dragon and the rest of the team just stole the kills right under his nose so very unfortunate there but great team play nonetheless they are making this part move very quickly and now they're just able to get a deflect kill. That's a huge advantage. And the square coming in, they might be trying to finish up this attack right now. Yeah, that fire strike just leading in is insult to injury of what we've seen. WLK has practically not even been able to even play this game. You can see great aspect already almost to that attack visor where WLK has been brought down three times to not even reach 50% into this fight. Grab though still being held on to for wrench, looking for an opportunity for a follow-up as the immortality field comes out. That could be an opportunity to take the momentum, but with a shatter underneath the payload, it gives more than enough room. A sleeping W WLK just can't play the game, period. Just just literally just needs the hands-off keyboard at the moment. Yeah, Reaper a great character, but even though you do a lot of damage, you still have to know how to play them. You gotta use that reform as a second life to get you out of certain situations. There's gonna be the grab coming out, but I don't think it's gonna be enough. Only finds one. The blade gonna be followed up by Riggs, and Riggs gonna get two. Riggs, what can he not do? And the answer is, he does everything. He just does it all. It's stellar play, as you said it. Swiss Army Knife, I would definitely agree, is a way to describe it with just the proficiency and not only a versatile wheelhouse of characters within one role, but having many in all three to boot. So definitely an individual to keep an eye out on and just really focus on their growth as an individual, but also how they're really working in tandem with this team. Riders just being fueled by so many dynamics. And honestly, the support line, we don't get to give a lot of credit off that often, but the support line has been stellar for Ryder to have nothing but full momentum forward. Riggs reminds me a lot of Mirror in the Overwatch League, just, you know, plays yeah. literally everything, just the hero pool so deep. And back in the old days of Overwatch, you know, you had players swap onto different roles, not only just for contests, but, uh, you know, just to play really wacky comps. But those are the old days of Apex and the MLG series. Man, it's crazy to think how long it's been since then. Meanwhile, Fairfield, they have not had a good go of it. Four minutes and seven seconds on the clock for Ryder. They finished with more time. They started the wave in. Fairfield, they are going to swap things up now. We saw them try to get off of that Hanzo. Did not work out now. So they're going to run the Symmetra Bastion composition. And I think you and I know exactly where this is going to end up. Yes, indeed. You commented earlier, like we said, where the Bastion on the defensive side was a little bit interesting. Does have its place, but on the attacking side is where it will look to flourish. And you can see, though, a little bit of a adjustment here. Bastion's not going to take the teleporter off the statue, but attempt to force out the immortality field, which does come down to keep WLK alive and play this opposing high ground balcony versus the statue. Yeah, I don't know why they tried to take this high ground. I know the Baptiste was there, but the statue is the best place to play it. And oh, oh my, my goodness, goodness, Ranger! Ranger, what are you doing to these poor souls? These nades have been nutty. I mean, we just, it's almost as if we saw that in slow motion, just go airborne. And all of us, I think, just had a moment of nah. -uh. Really, you're nah. -uh. Just stop it. Like, Ranger literally fitting a role as a rider for this team to make sure that they are carrying with these bio nades. That was from the top rope, and it landed. Now you're seeing again Fairfield. They had to swap things up. They're going to swap to a soldier and a Sombra. They've already lost a minute off the clock, and Saki has that blade ready to go. 
waiting and ready to unsheathe the blade. You see that Valkyrie gonna be forced out for Fairfield as you've all, oh, two down. This is going to be a great hold once again. And you've got the res forced out as well to attempt to stick into this. Honestly, Ryder's just gonna be in a healthy position of six ultimates and not even need to worry about it. You finally have the blade committed to just clean up the last couple, but I could have said, honestly, you didn't even need it. Yeah, you don't need it, but sometimes it's better to use those ults early on and rebuild them and hold on to them forever and not know when to. This lets you plan your next fights a little bit better. And you saw there that Great Essex, they went for the hack onto the Hanzo, and sure, it gets rid of their jump, it gets rid of their storm arrows, but the primary fire is the most dangerous part of that kit, and you saw Phoenix hit that headshot lights out. Oh no, and the Immortality Field was thrown out for the assistance on the D.Va to get back in mech, but there is an instant follow-up with the Dragon and strike that was a cooldown you wish you had back mask yeah that's gonna be that immortality field as well as their amplification matrix use there were some players that fell on the side of riders so right now fairfield can regroup quick enough they might be able to go in with a man or two advantage but it looks like they had to wait for that late Fall from Adrix. Adrix falling last in that fight, so now it is going to be a 6v6. Moving through Hotel, you've got the Somber looking for a critical hack in the back line, but just finding the short end of the stick there, being out of range. You've got Riggs with that amplification matrix. Again, a wide window to utilize for space to play this corner. Earth Shatter comes through, does block at least one, but there's still a couple in close proximity behind that do get overwhelmed. This is Fairfield's moment to really change this up, but you still have Soggy in the back cleaning up the support, and 76 are down, almost gets the triple onto the Sombra. The refocus onto the point with Riggs coming in with the pickup. 60 seconds to go, and Fairfield's feeling the Heat. That was a great play with the body block coming out from Adric to help keep Gallantry away from the immortality field, but it wasn't enough. Still, the follow up from Fairfield, they couldn't do enough. And Great Aspects has not been able to build an EMP up in the meantime, only at 67%. They could really use that right now in combination with Wrench's Diva Bomb. Hotel potentially Diva Bomb has to come out soon here after that shield and the barrier goes down from the Zarya. You've got a blade once again. Soggy in the back looking for the dash reset. Comes through on to the Mercy. You've got the Ryan close in proximity, but the Shimada brother strips it away. The deflect not allowing any more damage to come out from WLK. Grab looking to bring a couple of them back into the mix of things, but won't be able to do so. And these staggers now with Soggy just playing with the fate in the back line. Oh, finally had to go down. But there's yeah. just so much dominance. I mean, this Earth Shatter going to make sure nobody can touch it. That's going to be a round completion here with Ryder taking the second map, finding themselves on a match point. So their Soggy was like, sure, you can kill me, but have you met my big brother? And then immediately <laughs> Gallantry just comes in with the Shatter, stops any chance at a recontest there. And man, what a map from Ryder. You don't see the Genji often. We've touched about that a few times, but... Who cares? Look at Saw's movement. Look at the play. It's just brilliant. And I, for one, am terrible at Genji, so seeing <laughs> something like this just makes my eyes tear a little bit out of happiness. I mean, to be fair, I am a bad one as well, so you and I can be in the same boat as we just sit idly by with a box of popcorn hoping to just see a show. But, you know, speaking of show, we've already got, like we said, two points in favor of Ryder University, who, as we said, on the right side of the bracket is feeling pretty confident and looking to close this out. But we'll see if we've got Fairfield University able to turn it around, regain some composure and start being a contender against this team. So don't go anywhere as we've got this match coming up in just a moment.
Welcome back, friends, as we are here to continue on between Ryder and Fairfield as we see which one of these four-legged creatured mascot universities find a victory on the map of Temple of Anubis. We will be having Ryder on the attack with Fairfield on the defense. I am Rich Rat here with Jag as we are going to give the lay down of the law to see if Fairfield manages to actually take this to a fourth map. Absolutely, and they can do that via a win or a draw. It's 2 CP. I've seen it happen time and time again, but Ryder, they have had such a good showing that I'm not sure we're going to see a map for today. Fairfield, on the other hand, they definitely want to show a little bit more of what they've got. There have been some great plays, just the pieces of the puzzle haven't been completed yet, and now finally Riggs has returned to this hit scan role. So Riggs completing the full gauntlet of hero roles here in today's matchup. Map after map after map, dynamically changing the role. And we see a full spectrum as you've got this defensive side, though, with the John Crump managing to at least get an early pick for Fairfield. And that's really what you need to see. A lot of funnel damage into these doorways. You've got the concussion mind to cause some displacement, but this Maywall is going to divide the team. Can it be conquered with Ryder pressing forward? Soggy getting very low on the Ryan. Her does go down by Wrench. And you know, honestly, I think this is, even though it's only just the first fight, the weakest, I think I've seen Ryder go into an engagement. They lost their Baptiste very early on before they really able to pull and gaze, and they lost another character right there. So right now, you're seeing Fairfield, they're finally able to put up a little bit of a fight right now. Meanwhile, though, there is one person on the point for Ryder. It's Riggs on the Tracer, who's immediately going to fall in. Fairfield, they're just cleaning up these fights over and over again. They only are getting, they're only getting one or two picks. That's all that they need. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit more of a reckless play, to be honest, I feel, is the best way to describe it. Ryder just kind of coming in carefree. They've made some swaps, trying to adjust onto this. Riggs, I think, getting a little bit ahead of themselves, needing to be careful. We acknowledge that you're a stellar player, but can't allow yourself to be completely overrun. And I've seen this time and time again from teams that are up to, oh, they think the series is over, it's time to have some fun, mess around, play some things that you wouldn't normally play, but you don't ever want to give up anything for a moment. No, and the Riptide are now going to come up front, looking to try and get a pick. The Blizzard does solidify some presence on this point where you can see Riders start to take the advantage. The Valkyrie is actually a big, big ultimate to have going into this with that extra damage boost or healing necessary to swap between. A Bionade does come out, but since it is so late in the fight with already a couple art taken down early, Self-Struck easily going to be blocked either by the shield or the ice wall. This will be Ryder's first point to carry in with a decent time bank still. Yeah, they did lose two minutes, but still plenty of time to cap that second point fully. And you mentioned it earlier, that Valkyrie from Nifty Bean, it was massive. Not only did it keep the rest of the team alive once they lost their Baptiste Ryan, they also actually got a Battle Mercy kill there, so great play on the main support role. You can see Riggs in the back now. We'll look for a potential full spawn opportunity. Does get that trap out of the way, so we won't see that lockdown. Dragon Strike comes through, gets a double with a triple, but a triple pulse bomb in return. Riggs coming out to say, I can play too. With four minutes and 20 seconds, the numbers advantage for Ryder, cleaning up the last remaining members as the Diva gets demacked. One tick is going to for sure be taken here, but a regroup of as many as possible from Fairfield is necessary to hold on to this. There's gonna be the charge, but Adric gonna be found out with the bubble. So sorry if you're not gonna take much damage. The Nano being committed and they're stuck in the Junkrat trap. Looks like that Fairfield's gonna be able to hold for just a little bit longer unless the fight is turned around and just as I yep. say, I eat my words immediately. Yeah, that res comes through, securing the front line, allowing that secondary tank to get that necessary shielding to help influence the momentum back into the favor of Ryder as Fairfield now tanks a swap of sides. And it is do or die for this team to try and get into another round, mind you, where Ryder is feeling pretty comfortable with just under four minutes. They gained seven seconds on Gangs Row. They lost seven seconds here. So as all things are in the universe, even in the end, there's a great play there from Soggy. Hit a pretty good shatter. And I was surprised Riggs holding onto that pulse bomb could have found a few on the ground and said waited until more ultimates were used on the other side still was able to find a big play with that pulse bomb in the end found three sir riku just staying alive so long with an amazing amount of charge and zarya so scary when she is high charged i mean just a lot of patience and and game sense 
to go into that, being hesitant. That's, I think, one of the biggest things that I've noticed a lot more recently when it comes to Collegiate Overwatch is that even though we see so much action, there's a lot of ultimate usage, sometimes overcommittants, but there are those few individuals where when you see that patience and virtue to make sure that they can get the maximum amount of value and wait for that subtle moment, it really does shine. And one thing we didn't even mention was that Soggy, who was on the Genji before, is on the Raiden Heart, so there has just been a roller coaster of people on different roles here for Ryder. Still looking pretty dang good on the main tank. And now Riggs gonna give their own try at the Gengu. So we'll see how that Genji pick works out for them. Fairfield, they're running a Symmetra, and you and I, we just saw a play similar to this. They're gonna try to use that tele Sim Teleporter to either get all the way above and behind or just cut through the point. Oh, uh, but it doesn't matter. Riggs literally not even acknowledged on this Genji. It's, this isn't like a Faro where you take the ground game and you leave the bird in the sky. You need to acknowledge the Genji because he's going to keep cleaning up. One thing you got to point out is Ryan committed the immortality field to keep Riggs alive. And speaking of the Farah, her name has been called and now she will appear. Great aspects to swap onto that very deadly projectile hero in the sky. And there's no real direct counter from Ryder. They have that. And yes, he's hit scan, but his primary role is not to kill the Farah. Can I get a winning lottery ticket? I mean, ask and thou shall receive, at least in game, hopefully in real life. But Riggs, on the other hand, in real life, is cleaning up and just basically left to their own devices on this Genji, having a field day to do what they wish. But with the Farah again coming out into this, it does give some aerial positioning, allowing those rockets. You can just see this Riggs play once the bird taking her almost out of the sky. The dash was not there to get enough damage. Aspects right now is actually being the MVP swap selection though for Fairfield to keep this at least going into a second point. You saw the biggest play was that they killed Ryan early on. Nifty Bean went for the res and wasn't able to get it. Now Riggs gonna try their <laughs> own job at a blade and is gonna fight one before being just kind of cast aside. I have a strong feeling Riggs is going to be forcing a swap right now and just did that for the glory days because they for sure want to pick this match up as a win. And you can see it going actually onto the McCree. And I like that selection because of the crowd control because this momentum is fierce by Fairfield. The snowball effect could be really seeing that they're committing the sound barrier on the side of Fairfield. They want to fin this fight right here right now but every time they lose someone or trade someone out it's going to be in the favor of Ryder because their spawn is so much closer. Wrench actually did go down below, so that gives an opportunity to try and take advantage of this discombobulated positioning from the attacking side of Fairfield. Looks for the recovery, falls back, Rocket Barrage available, and especially with Riggs taking out that support line, there's no ability for Fairfield to keep in this. And right now, if you're Fairfield, you gotta go for this Barrage early and just, you know, use it, and then if it doesn't work out, it's fine. Far is not great here on the second point. That ceiling is so low for her. Every time she tries to go up, she's gonna hit it. So it's just, it's better to try to go aggro, try to get your best attempt at it early on and not let this happen where you get run into of a May Blizzard. Ooh, there was a lot of commitments to that far play to almost get her locked down inside of that Blizzard. But uh, Riggs gonna come rotate around, manages to get a follow-up pick up once again, keeping eyes on to Mass, which has not had a lovely time facing off against Riggs. Yeah, absolutely not. And Riggs now on the McCree. A much better counter to the far. Even though Riggs, honestly, was doing pretty well with the Genji just running up into the sky with those dashes. Now Riggs, after being on that hero for only a little bit of time, finds a way onto that high ground with the high noon. And they might be trying to play a bit passive to go for a flank, maybe to stay on that high ground and try to get a big pick. And doesn't even need the high noon, but going to use it anyway. Yep. Oh, with the earth shatter to boot. There is, you know, you know what? All right, that's fine. We get it. And because honestly, Ryder right now can play the slow methodical game and force Fairfield to walk into their domain because of how well Ryder is playing this composition. And they just keep getting rid of great aspects. The reds had to be used there and still they're going to fall once again. So this barrage, they've been banking on it for so long and haven't been able to find it. You said, I didn't know you could do that with McCurry, that jump. So uh, some cool new tech I learned about today. Meanwhile, Fairfield, their cool tech is that they have five ultimates online. Still have not been able to win these fights despite having a better all bank for most of the second point. 
honestly, at this point, if you don't get anything with this rock barrage and the far up play and it's taken down, it is definitely going to need to change. But WLK finds a sneaky pick in the back, also drawing attention away for the far to come through, but getting extremely low. Valkyrie has to be forced out by Zodiac Killer to stick into this. Rez, though, comes through by Ryder to get the Zarya back online for some shield coverage to allow a potential recontest. The grab gonna lock down Riggs, which is huge, but the immortality field comes out. It will not last for long. Two ticks already looking for the third. Ryder attempts to recontest, but that WLK Reaper Death Blossom opened up the floodgates to allow Fairfield to take this and at least have two minutes on the time bank. Is this the same WLK that we saw on King's Row? So it looks like the Reaper is bit much more efficient there. Right? Very, very well coordinated to find that advantage. And honestly, I think this is also a little bit of Ryder underestimating their opponent on this map after how the first two went, which they need to not allow themselves to get into that type of mentality. Exactly. I was just saying this earlier on the first point as they were losing it. You can't take it seriously. Not seriously. You got to take it seriously. Uh, there's a saying in football, any given Sunday, where it doesn't matter... What a team's, you know, win losses, it doesn't matter how good they are or whatever the analysts say. It just depends on how they show up that day. And if they show up to get put on a fight, right now you're seeing that Fairfield, they are fighting back. They do get that full cap on Anubis, something that we haven't seen yet from the losing side today. So they are showing signs of life, and it's always great to see. Maybe this is the start of the turn of the series. You never know. You can't count them out until it's over, and they are not out of it yet. And again, with two minutes remaining, Fairfield will be on the attacking first because the time bank was just under that four minute mark for Ryder. And I can honestly say that with the composition, you've got Riggs on this Torbjorn. Ranger gonna stick with the McCree. Riggs just looking to have a fun time. <laughs> I mean, it's Thursday night, right? Almost the weekend, just wanna enjoy yourself. This Torbjorn pick I think is better than the Genji, especially if you put Agreed. the Torb turret in a good spot you can put in a lot of little nooks and crannies on this map in well fairfield they have that brawl comp they're just gonna try to run under this choke point with the lucio speed there is a stun that comes out from the creep but they are still moving along yeah it just surpasses the edge of that shield which was critical to allow some of the momentum to be slowed but still going in favor of fairfield on this prison oh, and you got a little bit of an attention drawn to that turret on the high ground but there's still no follow the res comes through onto soggy but it's still reduced numbers Riggs can't find a rivet to hit its target for the life of them right now despite the value that we thought torgren could bring to this composition and fairfield's gonna take it Rick's known more as a hit scan player, and we've seen, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter if you're more hit scan or projectile. In this case, maybe don't play the projectile here because we're seeing the shots were not found. And now, the Mercy gonna get that quick spawn as well as Riggs. If they'd be able to stagger that out a little bit longer, get those late kills after the cap, that would have then given them a great advantage going into this next point. But still, nonetheless, they get a first cap very quickly, a minute and 20 on the clock. So even if they lose this first fight, they will have another chance to get the second point. This momentum is the biggest part where riders need to be very careful. Again, still going to stick onto this Torbjorn because of the Molten Core. I do understand how much value that can bring to remove anyone on the point. You've got at least a zoning opportunity. Does get WLK, which is critical. The Death Blossom is not there. Molten Core actually gained and thrown onto the point to try and step at the team up front, but it doesn't matter. The tank line is there to continue just eliminating player after player on Fairfield. And just with this amount of time remaining, 42 seconds i did not anticipate fairfield coming out strong on this map of temple of anubis the stragglers are there from rider but this is still going to be a completion i feel for the second point they get the baptiste they do lose, lose their lucio so they only have one healer is that mercy i don't think she has res online yet and you see the tracer killing so much time but that graviton surge might have zoned the rest of the enemies off the point if they can follow this up they will be able to get the full cap Rig's gonna go down. That should be the last couple of members. Again, still trying to stagger it out. Ultimately, Fairfield going to come in with this cleanup. Has the Earth Shatter just in case. Also to solidify it. The Lucio being brought down will prevent that movement speed on the inner tome. Is that is the team kill here? Shatter just to show off as round three completes with just 2.8 seconds. A little something. It may not be a lot, but something. That's really important because if Ryder also caps up under a minute. They both will get extra rounds. A third attempt to get a cap on Anubis. If Ryder caps with more than that, uh, things get a bit more dicey, but still, 
Who caps on Anubis of only two minutes? That's very impressive. Fairfield, they have figured out the combination to success. They are just running it down the gut of Ryder. And Ryder, maybe they thought the series was over already. Just leaning back a bit too much. It is not over, friends, until you see that victory screen. And it is not shown up. Right now, they're looking at a defeat on this map. They are needing to at least get two points to have another attempt. They do have more time, though. They do have a minute 30 extra, so they don't have to be as quick. Can be a bit more patient with it, but for the first time, they are staring down a loaded gun in terms of defeat. Absolutely, and, you know, honestly, I, on so, in some respects, I would almost say that there's a little bit more of an aggressive dominant play from Fairfield once the snowball momentum starts to come through. Ryder has been able to do the same, but there's also this subtle hesitation in some respects where they want to be sure of their actions, which is still very coordinated. But Fairfield, if they keep this up, they should be able to take this map. Seeing Riggs on the soldier, the legs have been locked. And I knew Riggs from that first week as that soldier who was going on these insane flanks, basically playing this character like a wrecking ball. Hasn't played it as much since those changes have come into soldier with the rate of fire and gonna be found out again. And right now, Fairfield getting two, three picks early on. Yeah, WLK really just changing up, I think, the mindset. You commented on it earlier where we're like, is this really the same WLK? And the Reaper play is stellar for this team right now. Yeah, instead of going on those long flanks, you see WLK for the most part playing on the team there. They saw that the soldier was out and about, did not even know that there was a Reaper in their presence and took advantage of that. You gotta, you know, be decisive about which way you want to do that. But oh, that pin from Sarifu, a great way to start this fight for Ryder. Yep. Getting Zodiac Killer out of this is critical. Now you're going to find the follow-up, looking to see if you can snowball even further. You've got Aspect rotating down underneath from Fairfield to try and regroup with the rest of the team. Getting a little discombobulated, though, as the Divas up front with the melee. Managed to take down the last few members. That's going to be Ryder looking to take this point and have a hefty time bank compared to what Fairfield had in the first attempt in this last round. Now you already see that that's soggy as well as rigs are going very aggressively onto that second point. The problem there for Fairfield is their rotation. They try to take the fight to them, but your defenders, you don't want to be running up onto the high ground if you don't have it already. You're putting yourself at such a positional disadvantage. You saw Sariku just waited for the rotation to come out, looked for that charge, found a squishing from there, and they were able to win that fight. You can see now one takedown already. Ryder needs to be fair. I would honestly just say don't go for this engagement. You're down, you're Reinhardt. You shouldn't be able to stick up that front. Just try and pepper in damage and stabilize some ultimates because you're going to need them with this time. Yeah, you're going to have at least three going on to the next push that you have. Maybe Choice. four, five if your tanks and Lucio can catch up. So you have some stuff to use. In the meantime, Fairfield, they have built up ultimates already. So they have more to use with immediately at the ready. So for Ryder, maybe just go for the dry fight instead of trying to win this fight out right here. You still have two minutes. You can get two, maybe three more fights. You get all the ultimates out here. You'll have a big advantage going into the next one or two. Trying to beat the corner. and We do have the dead eye coming through. Oh my goodness. You actually have WLK find the kill under Ranger. Riggs going to force out the tactical as well. Does get at least the melee kill immediately after. Needs to find another, but comes up short as the coalescence and the Reinhardt play up front is going to be more than enough. And having these three ultimates to secure these three ticks is going to be super important. You've got the sound barrier just in case if anybody comes back in to recontest. That focus fire from Riggs is going to instantly delete anybody that comes close the to charge. this point. Just nutty focus fire towards the end of this. And that's what you need to make sure that you've got some time in the bank. Beautiful grab eat by Soggy as well. This is just a matter of time, but you know, Fairfield giving it at all and just attempting to keep this won't be able to do much more. WLK just outside of that line as we complete round four and find ourselves entering into a fifth. I love six CP. It's a very fun map type. <laughs> but it's they're, great. They're, the caps are just a little bit under a minute, 56 seconds. So that is going to give Fairfield another crack at this attack. They're just going back and forth. Right or again with the time big advantage but it didn't matter much for fairfield they were still able to get the job done last time realistically they only have two fights on this first point to get it to get that first cap so they really have to play fast and furious but at the same time coordinated you saw what happened last time on the defense they just all were running into one position they weren't even thinking about who was behind them they weren't thinking of hey let's just take the point let them come to us so they got to play smart and they gotta play fast. Two things that sometimes don't work out very well because when you're under a time crunch like that, you just let your uh, 
to kind of go uh, into, I would say, a bit of a zombie mode. You just kind of let your uh, mechanics take the wheels instead of your brain. I mean, even more so to build on that is the fact that now you've got rigs. Almost in sense, every round on the defensive side kind of leveling up. You had the Genji, not really too much seeing it. Notoriously not the best pick. Okay. Torbjorn comes out, also not no to, like the best pick. Not notorious for doing too well, but it was a little better. Now we're seeing rigs on the Hanzo, and this could be enough to really hold Fairfield. Yep, has been leveling up that Super Saiyan amount. Now let's see if they can go blue. And yes, I am a Dragon Ball Z nerd, don't at me. We're seeing right now that Riggs trying to just shoot up from the high ground. They know that he's there, but they're just going to try to ignore him from the meantime. I wouldn't be surprised if oh. WLK tried to flank, but instead a great sun comes out from Ranger. The flashbang, leaving the Rhine vulnerable to not swivel that shield. Here comes another. Soggy cleans it up. 30 seconds to go. You've got Ryder sitting in a stellar position to hold on to this, and you make me proud by the way with that DBZ reference because I am a big buff as well. So we are on the same page, my friend, because this energy is over 9,000. It is over 9,000 indeed. Vegeta is molding and so is Fairfield. They had such a great first engage, but they lost to Reinhardt. Now they're going to again just cut right through the choke and they're going to charge in with Stariku. So now the Reinhardt from Ryder is there. No one falling just yet. Not at all, but again, with these last final seconds remaining, you've got Ranger looking to peek the corner, getting some assistance by Sagi to clean it up. One tick has been obtained, though, in this overtime. It will be the defensive hole by Ryder. But again, there's still a goal post here. So you've got Fairfield now able to potentially prevent Ryder from reaching at least the first tick and giving them some kind of opportunity to maybe hold this first point. If they are able to hold this first point and get this map point, it would be incredible. Ryder does have two minutes, so they can play a bit more comfortably. And can we just can we just see that that Riggs got the dragon strike kill at the very end? Right. On the WLK <laughs> just that's that's just great. I, I love it. Um. So you just see again the leveling up has occurred. Riggs playing back to the form we expect and is playing lights out all night on different roles. So maybe a bit hard to readjust to playing DPS after you play tank the first round and then support the second round. But regardless, you got to adjust on the fly. Seems like Ryder is doing that. They're taking this seriously once again. And now they know their win condition. They need just a little bit more than that first tick to secure this map and the series. Fairfield, meanwhile, they're playing for their lives. And now they are going to run the sim Bastion Strat once again. And this is a very unique one here for Temple Anubis. You got those two high grounds. So you set the Bastion up there at the big get go, and then you just use that teleport to go back and forth between the high grounds. I mean, some people may call it a cheese strat, but when it comes to moments like these, desperation, it still can work as long as you are coordinated enough to know how to hold defensively. And the biggest part of this is to know how to rotate if you are aggressed on. This is going to be that setup, as you said, with the Symmetra turret on that high ground. Will there be something from Riders? At this point, they just have to press the point. Exactly. They need to take the uh, the position right above where the high ground is. You're going to see, though, with that teleport, it's going to be very hard. They can't really play in natural cover, but oh. Soggy going to find the final blow. Riggs going to help find it out. And oh, my goodness, Ryder, they might have finally cracked the code to winning this map, but the res coming in onto the Bastion. I mean, yeah, the res is critical to get that Bastion back online. The biggest thing was that the immortality field was forced at the low ground versus across the way. So that's why you had WLK get taken down. But there's still another couple attempts here, potentially from Ryder. And look at Riggs just trying to hide right now in the background. He uses the sonar, realizes they're not there. So probably knows they're going to sit up on the other high ground. But there's the Lucio finding them out. So Mass knows they're there. You can now see a potential collapse coming through. Riggs having to go for that health pack underneath, attempting to get back to full health, but actually going to wait to get back into this. Climbing that wall for the side, looking for an opportunity to take down the Bastion. As WLK goes to the corner, no charge yet going to be forced out as it comes through. Does get a pan and a follow-up, but still, numbers advantage here in favor of Fairfield as it slowly sw swig wow. swaggers back and forth between the two. Ryder needing to just get the numbers advantage as there's 42 seconds left. This is a desperate position to be in to try and hold on to it. The numbers finally go in favor of Ryder. It is only the last remaining member, the Zarya on point, with now the supports coming in late. That will be it. Ryder, in the thick of it all, comes in galloping towards that final point and managed to take it in the end. The script writers would not be denied tonight. All of the teams on the right side of the schedule, they're going to walk away with 3-0 wins, but Fairfield looked very impressive here in defeat on this point. They put up one hell of a fight. They would not be denied overtime again and again. And 
you love to see it. Even when they're down, they are still fighting their hearts out. And kudos to you, Fairfield. You might have not walked away with a W, but you walked away with a lot of respect from me. I uh, 100% agree with you. Just perseverance to try and battle against a team like Riders, who, again, on that right side of the board, seemed to be dominating. It was very right side heavy or if my reverse mirroring shows the left so i should go that way for viewers <laughs> if that makes sense but again we still have some more exciting moments we actually do have an opportunity to have an interview as well to speak to an individual from rider where they can give us the insight of how they're feeling after that type of win especially after as you said at the beginning of the broadcast for this team where they've been you know away for a couple of weeks coming back in keeping the same mentality being able to keep that momentum and really demonstrate why they are still a competitor in this seventh week of eight. So don't go anywhere, friends, because we'd love to hear a word to see how they're feeling after this one. Welcome back, friends, as we are here with the amazing individual from Ryder who we did just see take a 3-0. We have Staraku here to join us for this interview. I'm Rich Rad here with Jag. And, you know, we're, we're really excited to see how well your team had played after we mentioned earlier in the broadcast that you have been, you know, away for a couple of weeks from EGF. What have you done to, you know, keep up in your competitive nature over the course of those couple of weeks before coming back here on EGF, my friend? Um... Personally, I've been going through a lot of comp. It's something I've never really done before, but mm -hmm. now I'm trying to get into it since here I am. Uh, we did do a couple of practices together. Uh, I think we, m majority of the time we were like doing off our own thing, but we tried to at least get together once, twice a week. You know, just make sure we were still down and not out of the uh, not out of the loop, not rusty, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So now you, you made the comment about, you know, doing a little bit more of competitive on your own. So do you typically not play competitive and really only focus on compositional? Like, do you try and test the waters a little bit at all? I just want to have fun. I just, uh, just <laughs> play when I want to play. So, so are you more of a quick play gamer? I'm just curious yeah, because I play much quick, more okay. of a quick play. Gamer. Yes, I would give you a high five if I was right next to you because I play so much quick play. It's absolutely absurd. Um. <laughs> So I just had to ask that. But now, you know, Jag's got a couple of questions, though, in regards to some of the, you know, players that we recently saw along with the maps that were played. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that great handoff, Rich. And I, I got to agree. Quick plays where it's at right now. I am not a fan of Ladder. I also play in a collegiate team. So it's great to see that even if you guys are not streaming as much, at least you're still keeping yourself, you know, ready. And you did great today. So congratulations on the win. I got to ask about Riggs. Riggs is a player that, I pointed out in the first week of EGF on that soldier roll, they really ran away with it, literally, because they were running all over the map. Today, though, we saw them on so many different, every roll, basically. So I got to ask, is this something that you guys had planned ahead of time? And if so, why? 
Ranger came to us, I think it was earlier today, and was got. He was like, "Guys, I have a crazy idea. You're all gonna love it. We're gonna go for it." And we we were all kind of like, "Okay, what's this idea?" So we were practicing earlier, and then we took like a little bit of a break to go get food and stuff, and then we came back, and he's like, "Okay, here's my idea." Riggs and I are going to be on every role at some point in this game, but we're going to be on it together. <laughs> and we were all just like, okay, well, this is happening now. Uh, and it seems to have worked out at least a bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, I wasn't even paying attention to Ranger swapping around, but you're right. They they were playing together, and it, it was, you know, I think there were some moments that were better than others, but especially, uh, I think, on DPS, they really seemed to have it under control by the end. But speaking of when they played DPS... On Temple of Anubis, it was a cool. bit shaky. You guys had a great start on the other two maps, but then it went to two extra rounds. Yeah. Very uh, competitive there from Fairfield. So do you think that was because of the composition you guys were running? Do you think you might have underestimated them a little bit at the end? I mean, it's fair to say that you underestimate a team if you've never played against them. Uh, so sure, we've watched their videos, but like, it's not the same as actually playing against the team. Um, mm -hmm. there, there were a couple of moments that any of us could have screwed up a little bit uh there was one moment where one of the tanks fell into the the mid hall and then died immediately and then we all just kind of fell um otherwise it was just it just happened <laughs> it just happens it well it just happens it's okay in the end because even though you guys you know you went to those extra rounds you still won at the end of the day so you can still pat yourselves on the back no map four in sight for this series the 3-0 victory is yours and Ryder to be at the top of the leaderboard in the top five so congratulations on another win and that's all that i have for questions and and again it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so very much again for your time my friend just taking Thanks. a few words with us i know you and your your fellow players are probably looking to celebrate a little bit after that and just have some good time or for you you might just want to return to quick play so there's nothing wrong with that so <laughs> <laughs> and we we'll do hope you have a i know right and we do hope you have a wonderful rest of your night so take care my friend and we look to see you continue you guys to play on you know over the course of the next couple of weeks so thank you so much for your time sounds good have a good one yes awesome and for all of you at home that have been tuning in that have been a part of the roller coaster that is today it is absolutely amazing to have you continue to be tuning in and supporting as we've got all of these colleges demonstrating their worth as they continue to grow into a more professional esports player in this industry and again jag it's been super awesome having the opportunity to cast with you i know we don't get to have much of an opportunity but it was absolutely a pleasure today my friend Oh, absolutely, Rich Rat. It's been a complete pleasure. If you haven't seen this guy yet, he cast the Varsity Tespa series. Also catch him casting Chinese Contenders, which isn't going on now as the season just ended, but be sure to catch him doing a lot of other amazing things. Also, a special shout out to Juke, our producer, who is loving debating us with these countdowns. But at the end of the day, <laughs> we still love him as well. And again, for all of you, as we've said, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Take care, happy gaming, and we'll look to see you next week for our eighth week of this Electronic Gaming Federation Overwatch fall oh, split. Correction, two weeks, actually. So we hope you have a wonderful night, friends.